answers or ask any questions that you might have. Let's go and watch carefully. So I want you to watch the screen very carefully and see if you can see another bird. So again, watch very carefully. Sometimes it takes a while to notice a bird. This one's quite small, but it's quite bright also. You might have to look carefully again. You will see a small yellow bird with bright red stripes on it, sitting up in a tree and it's got its head tilted up. It looks like it's singing. So it looks like it's singing because it is, it's got its mouth open, it's singing. And if you think about the bird world, what kind of birds are yellow? You know, do you see many yellow hawks? Do you see many yellow ducks? Do you see many yellow shorebirds? No, you don't. So only, there aren't that many yellow birds, but they tend to fall in the group called the warblers. And this is indeed a warbler and it's a yellow warbler. This is a male and we know that it's a male because of those red stripes on its chest. So good job if you were able to find this bird and an even better job if you were able to identify it, congratulations. There's another bird that has come up. And if you got used to looking up in the sky, well, this one's no longer in the sky. And remember when you're bird watching, you do have to make sure that you look here and there and everywhere because you never know where a bird might be. This bird happens to be right now on the ground. So if you found it, good job. And this is a little brown bird, a little brown bird with lots of spots on its chest. And it looks like it also has its mouth open singing. What is it doing? It's singing, it's on the ground. So it, this is a bird that typically you might see low to the ground actually. And that's another thing to think about when you're bird watching, where is the bird? The vultures in the sky and it's large. The warbler is in a tree and it's small. And this bird is on the ground right now, although you might see it in a tree also, but that's a good thing to think about is where do you see it? This is a wood thrush. This is a bird from the eastern United States that migrates down Mexico, Central America, and it's a long distance migratory bird. It's a beautiful bird with what's considered to be one of the most beautiful songs of all the birds that we have. So if you were able to identify this bird, again, good job. I've just put up another bird. Where is that bird? And it's moving, moving so fast. It's a little tiny bird. In fact, it's in the group of birds that we know as being among the smallest of our birds. So if you've guessed it, and especially in the way it moves, you don't actually have to see this bird to know what group it belongs in. You don't have to see it close up to know what it is or what to know what group of birds it belongs in because it moves so quickly. And the reason why it's moving so fast is it usually hovers when it's feeding. Now you might see it hovering around flowers and especially flowers that are that are like pendulums that have a big, uh, a big flowering head that they can reach their long beak into. And what they're looking for is that nectar. They want the nectar because that is their source of food. This is the hummingbird family and hummingbirds because they fly so fast and because they don't really sing, they can be hard to detect and hard to identify. But this one with its bright red chin, if you are in the Eastern United States, you might be able to say, oh, I definitely know that this is a ruby-throated hummingbird. If you saw it somewhere else, um, maybe it straight off course or it's mixed in with some other species in Texas, it might be a little harder to identify it if you're not so familiar with them. Maybe it's migrated and it's in Mexico. Uh, so wherever you might see it. Um, this, this hummingbird actually travels as far as Costa Rica, and they're the smallest of our migratory species. And they're one of the birds that if you were able to watch the, the session on collisions and windows, it's actually heavily impacted by collisions. It doesn't see windows, and they are one of the species that often flies into windows, maybe because a lot of us are using nectar feeders. So when you think about where to put your feeders, please make sure you put them in a place where you aren't actually attracting birds to your windows. This is again, a ruby throated hummingbird. I've just put up another one and you have to look around because where did I put it? Where did it come in? Is it on the ground? Is it in the trees? Is it flying? Where would it be? So this bird 
is a dark bird too, at least in this dark forest. It typically flies, it can fly very fast and straight. It just flew across our screen. Now this bird, if you know what it is, you'd say, what the heck is it doing in the forest? It doesn't really belong here. And it doesn't, but maybe it's heading somewhere where it does belong. This bird likes to eat aquatic animals, so it might actually spear a fish. If you look at its silhouette, you can see that it looks like it has a very strong, very pointed beak, um, an amazing beak, actually. So this is a belted kingfisher, and this species does like to be near water. It nests by on the banks of streams and creeks. And again, it feeds on fish and other aquatic organisms. What about this one? Now you couldn't miss that one, but it does look a little strange walking around in the forest. So another tip when you're out and you're birding is to think about, hmm, does that bird actually belong here? Or what kind of bird would that be based on the habitat I'm in? Now, if you saw this bird in the forest, you might want to report it because it would be quite odd uh, to see this species. This is a very large bird. And if you guessed that it's a sandhill crane, you're correct. This is a sandhill crane, um, an amazing species that is migratory also. It's uh, already headed north. I know it passed over Colorado where I live, or many of them did. And there was actually a sandhill crane festival not far from where I live. But this species doesn't usually, is not usually in a forest. In fact, when it's migrating, you often see it in agricultural fields where it feeds on some of the grains that are in the fields. So you might say, when you're trying to identify a bird, what kind of species would it be if it were here? And our last species, what is this one? And I'm sure that you know just by shape what this one is. Everybody knows, I think, the outline of a duck. This is a kind of a duck. And just like with the sandhill crane, would you normally see a duck walking down a path in a forest? No, probably not. You shouldn't see a duck walking down a path in the forest. Of course, you never know. Somebody will probably write in and say, hey, I saw a duck walking down a path in a forest once. Um, but typically, you know where you're going to see ducks you're going to see ducks near water. They like to be in the water. They're not actually great walkers. So even though you'll see some of them walking uh, from place to place, they, they really like to stick close to their water resources. Um, but this is a green wing teal. All of these birds were created and illustrated. This is actually art. These aren't real photographs. This is the art that our artist Sarah Woolman created for World Migratory Bird Day 2021. So we want to thank her for this very beautiful art and for letting us use it in so many different ways. Um, so thank you so much for this basics of birding. And now what I'm going to do is turn you to a video um, where you'll learn a little bit about migration and why birds migrate. Thanks so much. And hopefully, if you're watching, you remember those species names. Oh, hey, everybody. It's me, Mr. Train. I was just cleaning my binoc. Wait a minute. That sounded like a northern parala. Hmm. What? And that sounded like a black-throated blue warbler. Wait a minute. What day is today? It's World Migratory Bird Day! Migratory Bird Day? That's my favorite day of the year! Yay! Listen, birding is the mister beyond nature training better. We are learning words and birding lessons. Love and wonder turning nature better. When we're learning wording, birding lessons learning. Mr. Train's life lessons for better birding and beyond. I am so glad that you're here on Migratory Bird Day. Migratory Bird Day is all about celebrating nature and birds and the wonder of the migration. Wait a minute, I'm starting to hear some funky music. That means it's time for a Mr. Train Bird Word. Mr. Train's Bird Word, Mr. Train's Bird Word. Hmm, we have some scrambled up letters here. Let's see if we can make a bird word with that.
It's migration. Mm, migration. The word migration simply means movement from one area to another. Maybe you or someone you love has migrated from one country to another. Birds migrate too. In fact, one way that you can note the changes in the seasons is by noticing all of the birds who travel from north to south or south to north. Bird migration has been going on for millions of years. Scientists are still unraveling the mysteries of bird migration. But one of the things that I love about Migratory Bird Day is that everybody has an opportunity, no matter where you live, to enjoy all the amazing wonders that birds have to offer. I like to enjoy Migratory Bird Day with my birding buddies. Take a look. Here we are celebrating together. We went out for an amazing bird walk. We saw more than 14 species together. And then we drew some pictures of our favorite birds. We had so much fun. My best birding buddy and I both wore our Migratory Bird Day shirts. Aren't we having a good time? That is what Migratory Bird Day is all about getting together with your birding buddies, having a good time, and celebrating birds and migration. One more thing, if you go out and celebrate Migratory Bird Day, and if you learn some amazing new things about how you can help birds, take a picture with your birding buddies and send it right here so that we can celebrate along with you. A lot of people ask me, Mr. Train, what can I do to celebrate Migratory Bird Day? There's really only three things you need to do. Get your birding buddies, Go outside and keep your eyes to the skies. Listen, birding is the news. There be on nature training better. We are learning words and birding lessons. Love and wonder turning nature better when we're learning wording. Birding lessons learning. Mr. Train's life lessons for better birding and beyond. We want to thank Mr. Train. <laughs> we, in fact, just met Mr. Train and he put that together just for us, which was just fantastic. Hey, I want to invite you guys to get ready for our first online quiz. And we might have to do it a little differently than we originally said, Griselda, if you want to come on and join me. Um, we have a few prizes, uh, depending on if you're signing in as a school or a family. So, um, we have some prizes that you might get if you win. So for example, we have this wonderful, uh, I don't know what you call it. They call it a who rag, which I don't know where that name comes mm -hmm. from, but this is our Mejor Volando who rag, which is a wonderful prize. Um, if you take our quiz and you're the winner. Um, and we have some other fun things such as our bird buddy bracelets, which your entire class could compete to win. So if you're, out there and you're a class, we're going to give you time to get into this. So I'm going to put up uh, some instructions for you. And here we go. Griselda kind of took the reins here. Do you want to give them the instructions or I'm happy to keep going, whatever you prefer? Um, yeah. So First of all, thanks everyone for joining us for our first Kahoot. So the first Kahoot is the what's that bird Kahoot. And like Susan mentioned, there will be some gifts. So that's really exciting. Um, the way you can access this quiz on Kahoot is by, um, as Susan's showing there, by going to kahoot.it. And then you have to enter a specific um, pin number. But Susan, I believe it's, a new one because it's a new pin number is um, shown yep. every time. So and that's it's on the screen. Um, so they should be able to see that now. It should be live on the screen. I've shared my slides. Yeah, but I don't, I don't believe that's the um, the pin that's coming up for me. That they I just said happen. it. So hopefully it's still stayed there. Oh, okay. Um, so that one should be live. I'll check it though, but um, perhaps uh, someone there could go in and go on and enter the pin and start playing just to check it. But like Griselda said, this is our pin number. You enter the pin when you go to kahoot.it, it will show you a place just to enter a pin. That's all you need to do is enter the pin. And then you'll be into the game. Um, the game is just five questions and you should answer them. We're actually gonna keep Kahoot up for a little while. 
and uh, give you time. Okay, so it is live and it's working. So it is our Celebrate World Migratory Bird Day 2021 five question quiz. You have plenty of time to take it because I think what we're going to do is we are going to leave it up for a while because I know it takes a little while for everybody to get on. And then we're going to come back later and we're going to announce the winners. So again, if you're watching and you want to play the first quiz for prizes, um, please go to kahoot.it and enter the pin number that's on the screen and join the game. And so we can decide, I guess I want to pull this down because we have a guest speaker who actually is on now and maybe could go a little bit early. Um, let me take down this. Hopefully everyone has that pin number, but maybe we can pull it up again a little bit later and we'll share it with you again. So that's, I think that's what we'll do. Araceli, are you actually ready a little bit early? I noticed you came in. Yeah, that's totally fine. Great. Why don't you go on and put your camera on so I can introduce you. Hello, Great. everyone. Hi, Araceli. It's so nice to see you again. It's so nice to be with you all today again. Excited to learn more about birds. Yes, Araceli um, was actually in our one of our internship programs um, last summer. So she worked at with Indiana Dunes National Park. And then we, she helped us with some bird programming for schools in Texas. And she's a great educator. And she's also done a video that we're going to share with you. So Adeseli, I think we'll show that video maybe after you do your presentation. Um, hopefully okay. we don't mess anybody up by going a little bit early. Uh, but maybe you can spend a little time introducing your presentation and then I'll get off and let you get started. Yeah, for sure. All righty, folks. It's so good to see everybody today. So I know we've all been learning about different topics of birds, but my, for my presentation, I'm going to go into a little bit of the mathematics. I know that sounds a little boring. Maybe some of you guys aren't fans of math. I know I wasn't the biggest math fan when I was a kid, but math is actually really important when it comes to migration of birds because there's a lot of data and data has a lot of numbers and these numbers and data help us be able to better understand the patterns of migration of birds. Alrighty, let me go ahead and put up our presentation for today. I'm gonna stop sharing my video so the presentation goes on screen. All righty. Okay, folks. So to begin, we're going to learn about how far some of the longest, the birds that migrate for the longest distance go. Okay. So Around the world, there's been about 10,500 species of birds that have been identified. So that actually means there's still potentially a lot of other species of birds that humans just haven't identified. And particularly in North America, so North America would be the United States and Canada, about 340 different species of birds actually migrate. So if we look at this map right here on the right side, let me go ahead and turn on my laser pointer. This map right here, so we have the United States of America, Canada, then we have Mexico, Central America, and Southern America. Do you see there's a bunch of little dots that just keep on moving back and forth between North America and South America. And if you see, as they're moving, they're changing colors based on the month, okay? So what we can learn from this graph, this graphic is that as you see during the spring and summer months, see, spring and summer, the birds are in North America. So they're in the United States and Canada. 
And then once we start to get to the end of summer, autumn, also known as fall, and then winter, whoa, all these birds are flying over to Central and South America, okay? So we're, before we talk about numbers of migration, we wanna talk about the different types of migration. So normally types of migration are divided into four. We have our birds that are permanent residents. We have birds that are altitudinal migrants. We have our short distance migrants and our long distance migrants, okay? So permanent residents. This is a Northern Cardinal. And even though these two different birds are different colors, these two birds are different colors, they're actually the same bird. This is the male and this is the female. So that's something really cool that maybe you have already observed in bird species, that in a lot of species, the male tends to be the more colorful bird than the female. So the Northern Cardinal is a permanent resident. And as you can tell by this map, this like purple blue color shows you where the cardinal lives and it you can find it there year round. So no matter what month it is, you'll find the Northern Cardinal in this area that is purple, okay? I'm in California, I'm all the way in California over here. So we don't really get those. But if you're in this side of the United States or in Mexico as well, you might see some Northern Cardinals. Okay, the next type of migrants are altitudinal migrants. So the northern bobwhite is one species of bird that is alt altitudinal migrant. There's different species, but I decided to focus on this one. So the northern bobwhite, you can actually find it on the east side of the United States year round. So now you might be thinking, well, why is it called an altitudinal migrant if it's in one place year round? Well, the reason is that the northern bobwhite moves from lower elevation wintering grounds to higher elevation breeding habitats, okay? So like during the summer and spring, it'll be at the top of the mountain or towards the top of the mountain. And then during fall and winter, it moves back down the mountain, okay? So that is why the northern bobwhite, although you can find it year round in this location, it is an altitudinal migrant because it goes higher or lower up the mountain depending on the season, okay? Our next type of migrant is a short distance migrants. I'm sure plenty of you have seen this famous bird, can the Canada goose. Okay, let's look at this map. It might be a little confusing. The Canada goose is an interesting species. So it is a short distance migrant, but Studies show that different populations of Canada goose have different migration patterns. So some populations of Canada goose aren't going as far south in the winter as they used to. So their migrating patterns are changing. This is something that scientists are studying to try to understand why their migration patterns are changing, okay? So that's why you have different, you have the three colors here. So we have some Canada goose that you can find year round, right, across the top half of the United States. And then we have our populations of goose, of geese that actually do migrate. So they're breeding over here and then non-breeding over here during the seasons, okay? So Canada goose is one complicated bird. Our next type of migrants are long distance migrants. Typically, long distance migrants tend to cross large bodies of water. In other words, the oceans are part of the oceans, right? So this is a cliff swallow. And as you can see, it's found in Canada, all the United States, and then, oh my gosh, look at this extremely long journey. It goes all the way to South America, maybe into some of Argentina. That is one long trip. Now we're gonna get into the fun part. Numbers, drum roll please. Dun. All right, Neoarctic Neotropical Migrant. Whoa, what does that mean? I'm sure you're asking yourself, it sounds scary. 
it's not. So this is the name that is used to describe the birds that we were just talking about. The migrant species that tend to be in Canada and the United States during our summer, during the summer in North America, and then they spend their winter in Mexico, Central America, South America, or even the Caribbean islands. So let's take a look at this table, this information. So if we see here, we have species, the miles that they travel to migrate, their breeding range, and their wintering range. So wintering range means where the birds are during the winter time here in North America, and breeding range where they are during the summer in North America, okay? So let's see, the paint and bunting travels about 300 to 3,000 miles from the United States to Mexico, Panama, or the West Indies, okay? The common night hawk travels anywhere from 2,500 to 6,800 miles. It's found in Canada, and then during the winter, it travels all the way down from Colombia to central Argentina. The cliff swallow travels anywhere from 1,250 miles to 6,800 miles from Alaska, Canada, the U.S., or northern Mexico, all the way down to Brazil, Bolivia, and central Argentina. And last but not least, the little wood thrush travels anywhere from 600 to 3,750 miles from Canada or the United States all the way to Mexico or all the way to Panama. These little birds like to travel. I wish I could travel as much as these birds do. All right, so based on this data, let's think. Which bird travels the farthest? Remember, we gotta look at the miles. Based on the miles, ding, ding, ding the common hawk, and ding, 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 the cliff swallow travel the farthest, see? 6,800 miles. That's a long way to go. Another way that people might describe this type of migration from Northern America to Central or Southern America is by talking about the Tropic of Cancer. The Tropic of Cancer is an invisible line that's drawn around the entire Earth horizontally, okay? And so you can see it divides North America from Central and Southern America, okay? All right, so now we know Tropic of Cancer, right? We kind of know where that's at. Tropic of Cancer goes across like this, whoop, whoop, 23 degrees. Fun fact, you can share that knowledge with your friends. So now we're looking at some birds that, whoa, they travel pretty far. Look at these birds. They're traveling from the near Arctic, right? Whoa, look at the blue throat. Look at the northern weed ear. It goes all the way to Africa. The Arctic turn goes from, oh my gosh, all the way from one pole to the other pole of the earth. The American golden plover, whoa, all the way to Brazil. Man, the Arctic turn travels the furthest, you can see here. Oh, now we're gonna get into numbers. Okay, math time. We're gonna start with the Arctic turn because as we just observed, it is one of the birds that has the record for the longest migration. It goes from the North Pole all the way to the South Pole, okay? So this is the Arctic Tern. And here, if you look at this picture, we have the planet. Then we have, whoa, that's the North Pole. This is the South Pole, okay? So it travels from pole to pole during breeding grounds from the Arctic over here. This is the Arctic. It might get a little confusing because the Arctic kind of sounds like Antarctica, right? But it's different. 
okay? They fly down typically either down the African or Brazilian coast, right? So you can see it goes either down this coast or down this coast, right? The interesting thing is that when they return back up to the North Pole, they always tend to fly in this interesting S pattern, okay? So remember, the Arctic turn either goes do, 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 down the coast of Brazil or down the coast of Africa. But always when it returns to the North Pole, it goes in this interesting S pattern all the way back up, okay? So typically from one pole to the other pole, it takes about 21,500 miles to travel. That is a lot. <laughs> so round trip, what we do is we multiply, right? We multiply that. So round trip, it travels 43,000 miles, okay? So now when I ask you, how many miles do they travel from Greenland, which is up here, to Antarctica, Antarctica, right? I already said the answer, so you guys should know this information by now, but a clue would be here, right? Round trip, so from the north to the south, and then back all the way up to the north is 43,000 miles, okay? All right, so let's try to better understand how far that actually is. Because yes, we know it's a really, really big number, so it's a lot of miles, but let's try to compare it to a distance that we can be a little more familiar with, okay? So we're gonna compare it to the distance of California to New York, okay? That trip from California to New York is 3,000 miles, okay? So you have 3,000 miles. And remember, the one way trip from the north to the south is 21,500 miles. So, to see how many times the Arctic turn would fly from California to New York to New York to California, we need to divide that by the 3,000 miles. Okay? So, 21,500 miles from the north to the south divided by 3,000 from California to New York, all right? So one little trick we can do in division is we can take away some zeros. That'll make our math a little easier. So we take away the two zeros from both 3,000 and 21,000. So now we're dividing 215 by 30, okay? How many times does 30 go into 215? Hmm, let's think for a little bit. Seven. Seven times 30 is 210. Next, we're going to subtract, okay? So 215 minus 210 is only five. That's a very small number, five. Hmm, but now we're kind of stuck, no? 30 can't go into five, that's impossible. So what we have to do now is get into decimals, dun, dun, dun. So now we have to add a decimal after 215 and a decimal on top after seven. The decimal lets us add a zero, which we can bring down to 50, right? So that five is now 50. And now, oh, 30 does go into 50. I can do that. 30 goes into 50 one time. One times 30 is 30. 50 minus 30 is 20. Oh no, we're back again. This number is smaller than 30. 30 doesn't fit into 20. So what do we do? Once again, we add a zero at the top after the decimal, and we bring down another zero. So now, whoa, 20 turns to 200. That's a pretty big number. But 30 can go into 200, right? 
So how many times does 30 go into 200? Mm -hmm. Give me a few seconds. Ready? Six. It goes into 200 six times. Six times 30 is 180. And oh, wow. Let's think about this. 200 minus 180 would be 20. And then we would just keep going. This decimal would keep going. So it'd be 7.16666. And then a seven because we would round up. So that's why I decided not to include that. It's confused. I don't want to confuse you guys with so many numbers. But now we know, okay, so the Arctic turn would go approximately, right? 7.16 times from California to New York. It takes us humans, right? It would take us months, months just to go one time from California to New York. But there you go, 7.167. That's crazy. Okay, now let's look at another bird, the common nighthawk, okay? This is a picture of him, it's pretty cute. So the common nighthawk, you can see, it's found in Canada, right? And then it tends to take two different paths to migrate down south for the winter, okay? So it either migrates through Central America, right? And then ends up in Argentina, or it tends to migrate again from Canada, but then down Florida, right? And then up to the top part of Brazil, okay? So we're gonna look at some numbers that have to do with the common nighthawk. So the common nighthawk, if you guys remember from the bar graph that I showed you guys, or from the information that I showed you guys earlier, can travel up to 6,800 miles, right? But the middle or the median of the travel of traveling those miles would be 4500 okay so that's kind of the average that's what median means median means average so although the common nighthawk can travel more than 4500 right 4500 is that sweet number that's in the middle from the smallest to the longest or biggest um, migration miles right okay so we want to try to find out how much it would be round trip. So not just from Canada down to Argentina or Canada down to Brazil. We want to know what it would be from Canada to Argentina and then back again from Argentina to Canada. So one way to do that is by addition, right? So we could add 4,500 plus the same thing, 4,500, because that's how much it's one way. So we're asking for two ways. And then when we add that up, let's see. Zero plus zero, that's just zero. Another zero and zero, well, zero again. Five and five is 10. Hmm. But I can't write 10 down here. So what you do is you add the zero, but then you carry the one. The one from the 10 goes over here to where the fours are, okay? So now we actually are gonna add the one to the four and to this four, okay? So four plus four is eight. And we add one, that gives us how much? Nine, 9,000 miles would be the average of the round trip. So back and forth, from North America to South America, and then back again from South America to North America. Okay, that would be 9,000 miles. Another way we could do this is by multiplication, okay? So for multiplication, we would just have the one-way trip amount of miles, 4,500 times two, okay? Two times zero, is just zero. Two times zero, oh, that's just zero again. Two times five, that's 10. But remember, 
we can't add 10 down here. We can only add the zero and the one, just like in addition, has to be carried over, okay? So we add our zero down here and then bloop, magical one gets carried over. Two times four is eight plus one gives us nine, okay? So 9,000 miles would be the average round trip of the common Nighthawk, okay? So now a little trickier question. How old is a Nighthawk that has flown 63,000 miles during migration? Hmm, you may be thinking, how are we going to find that out? Well, remember, we do have the number that we just previously solved, the average round trip, right? So back and forth from North America to South America, it's 9,000 miles. And that's the trip that they would make in one year, right? So now to find out how old, how many years it has been that a net hawk has migrated during these miles, 63,000 miles, we're gonna do some division. And we're gonna do the trick that we learned, right? We take away the zeros. Zeros just make our life a little harder, okay? So we take away the zeros. Hmm. Oh, this is easy, simple division, right? If you know your nines times tables, I'm sure you already beat me to the answer. So how many times does nine go into 63? Any guesses? Hmm, 63 divided by nine. Seven, that's it, seven. So now we know that the Nighthawk that has flown 63,000 miles is seven years of age, right? Because 9,000 fit seven times into 63,000. Even though we took away the zeros, okay? We just took away the zeros to make it a little easier. But that's how and what this number, the seven, still means, okay? Even though we took the zeros away, it doesn't change the meaning of the seven. So the Nighthawk is seven years old, okay? Alrighty, so now I'm going to end in a fun little activity, okay? You want to pay attention because all of a sudden a lot of birds are going to appear on screen and they're kind of flying around so it's a little hard to keep track of how many birds there are, but I'm going to give us only 15 seconds, okay, for you to see how many birds there are, okay? Ready, set, go. Okay. Oh, more. Okay, that was 50 seconds. I hope you all were able to keep track of some of these birds. Okay, so now that we have time to officially count, right, there's 15 birds in total. There were 11, what was that bird called again? That bird was in one of the first slides. 11 northern cardinals, and there are four hummingbirds. Okay, perfect. Well, that was our cute little short lesson on the mathematics of migration. I hope you all enjoyed that. It was a short 20, 24 minutes, but that's as much math as we could get in there, okay? Hope you all learned something fun today. That was great, Araceli. <laughs> and just you. for everybody who's watching, the, the last exercise that you put up is so true, right? So if you're someone who studies birds, often you have to count them and you have to count them fast, don't you? In real life, it's a lot harder. They don't stay on the screen after 15 seconds. No, they don't. <laughs> they sure don't. Um, I didn't see any questions for you yet. They're probably still working on their math problems there. What do you think? <laughs> they might be. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you want to add, Araceli? I want to add that, especially since a lot of us are doing distance learning. I know it can be a little hard and tiring 
because everything has to be, you know, done digitally. And it can be easy to forget to take time to go outdoors. We're all learning about birds right now, which is amazing, fantastic, and it's making us exceptional scholars. But you want to try to take that information and go outside and apply it. Even if it's just walking around your neighborhood, there are a lot, surprisingly, a lot of different species of bird around your neighborhood. I can guarantee you that. Okay? So don't be afraid to walk down, you know, a street you have it in your neighborhood because you're like, oh, people might think I'm just like looking funny walking down the street, just looking at birds. That's fine. Don't be shy. Go out there and you observe those birds. Thanks. That's such a, that's a, such a good thing to remind everybody about because yes, we want everybody not to be in front of their computer all day, but to go outside and to actually see birds. And I think that your other good point is that they're everywhere. So even if you live in a city, um, there are birds in cities, and you would be surprised at the variety of species that migrate through cities. So we encourage you to go outside with a purpose of noticing birds and seeing what you can out there. I think what we'll do now is we'll share your video about what to wear when you go birding, Araceli. It's a great video, so give them <laughs> something else, to another tool in their bird watching kit. And then after that, hang in there. We'll announce the winners of the first Kahoot quiz. Sounds so thank good. you, Araceli. Thank you again for participating and presenting today. You're very welcome. Take care, everyone, and pay attention because we're all just giving you a bunch of tools to become a better birder and environmentalist. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
Steph wins the third prize. So again, if you, I just called your name and I'll put this up again later to you on a slide, we want you to get in touch with us at info at environmentamericas.org. We'll write you back and we'll send you your prize. Um, and that'll be a lot of fun. So thank you so much. Uh, we are, And we have another quiz just to let you know, we have a lot of other activities coming up. The day is not over yet. Um, next up, we have Stump the Experts. So if you want to talk to some bird professionals, researchers, uh, and ask them some questions, we're going to bring them on right now to do that. Uh, but we'll have another presentation starting at um, about half, a- half after the hour. And then we have another Zumba class. So if you weren't up early enough this morning, Laura from Trinidad is going to come back with us and teach her Zumba like a bird class again. So get up and get moving as the day draws to a close. And then we'll go to Aliyah, who is also from the Caribbean, and she will bring you to her junior book club. And we'll have another quiz after that. So you'll join us for another Kahoot and we'll look forward to that. Uh, So sign on again to win more prizes. There's nothing that says you can't try again. So please do that. And then we have art uh, and then we'll be closing the day. Um, But the program continues tomorrow. So I'd like to bring on our our experts now, if we could. We have Miguel Mata, who is actually our World Migratory Bird Day coordinator from Venezuela. We have Daniela Sosa, who is from our Mexico coordinator. And we have Jordan Rutter, who is with the American Bird Conservancy. So thanks to all of you for joining us today. What I'd like to do is give all three of you a chance to introduce yourselves. And since I think people have had a chance to meet Miguel and Daniela so far, Jordan, I'm going to start with you and let you introduce yourself first. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to just talk about birds with all of you. I have been interested in birds since I was little, and now I'm really lucky because I get to talk about birds for my job. And so talking to you all about birds is my favorite thing other than the birds themselves. Um, as, as Sue said, I'm the Director of Public Relations at the American Bird Conservancy, which is an organization that's working to protect birds across the Western Hemisphere, and we focus on conservation. So if you have questions about how you can help birds, that's definitely something I can help you with today. Thank you, Jordan. And I'll go to Daniela. Uh, well, I'm, I'm Daniela Sosa. As Susan said, I'm the Mexican coordinator of of World Migratory Bird Day, and I also work and collaborate in, with the Programa de Aves Urbanas. It's a science, scientific, uh, citizen science program in Mexico uh, for, with Conavio. Uh, well, it's part of Conavio and also different bird projects, and I'm really happy to be here. And I know that you're especially interested in sound recordings. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love sound recording and every this. Uh, special things that do birds. I think sound recording is brings us show so show us a lot of how be- birds uh, behave, and I think it's like a key, a really important key to know better birds. That's why I love it. Great, thanks, Daniela and Miguel from Venezuela. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Susan, for inviting us to this panel. Uh, everybody know me because I am the Latin American coordinator doing educational program and try to reach communities in, in arise awareness about migratory birds. But in Venezuela, and I am also part of the Fels Ornithological Collection, is the most older and most bigger collection of, in any Latin American countries. They have 80 years working on birds in Venezuela, and now I am. I am the head of the committee of tracking and marking and monitoring beers in Venezuela. So this is a new initiative to follow beers through banding and new technology. And also I am passionate about Next Architecture. So I am, I am the founder of the Next Collection of Beer in Venezuela that is now the most larger and diversity collection of Next and Eds in Venezuela. So. We are here. so happy to answer all that question from John, and thank you so much. 
And you're going to be definitely all of you an inspiration to everybody who's online. You're all so talented and knowledgeable. So we're inviting people to ask questions. And I know we've already got one, um, although it might, it might not be a stump the expert since I'm assuming uh, that species is up for a reason. I'm going to go then. What we'll do is we'll take questions from our viewers who are online on various Facebook pages and on birddaylive.com. So if you're watching, send in your question. We've got a spreadsheet up, so we, we are going to go to them uh, as you put them up. But we also have some questions that have been sent to us uh, from students. So they are, we will play those videos and then we'll see if you can answer those as well. We have a bunch of them, so we're not going to have enough time to do them all, but we'll do as many as we can. So the first question of the day is from Buzz, and this is not a stump the expert question, but let's go on and answer it. He wants to know what kind of bird is behind you, Jordan. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I have a black-throated blue warbler in my background. It's a picture that I took a couple years ago during spring migration. Can you tell us a little bit about that warbler? Yeah, so this warbler actually was first thought to be two different species because the male and female look completely different. Um, the black-throated blue warbler is a really great name for the male, which is in my background, but the female doesn't have these striking colors. So when they were first described, they were thought to be two different species. So yeah, <laughs> I'm just seeing Miguel's face and it's, it's a really interesting uh, part, of, part of this individual yeah. bird's history. Um, this bird uh, winters uh, uh, largely in the Caribbean. And then right now I'm excited to say that I just saw my first one of the season this, this week in my area. I'm located in Washington, D.C. Exciting. That's exciting. Great. Well, thank you for that answer. And um, we have another question, Stump the Expert. When is it okay to put up your hummingbird feeder? Who would like to take that one? Daniela, I see you moving. Uh, well, it depends where you live, right? Uh, for example, here in Mexico, you can have it all year long, but it's better to put them like when flowers are out, like, uh, well, I don't know the word in English, like when all this, uh, um, um, let me, I forgot the name, where everything is dry, all the vegetation is dry. So it's better to put a humming of hummingbird feeders so hummingbirds have uh, more resources to, to have food, right? But you can have them all year long, but it's really important to, to, put, to maintain them clean, um, to clean them uh, constantly so they don't have these um, uh, fungus or any, any diseases that they, they can come here, right? And well, yeah. in the United States and Canada, during migration is perfect to put them. So hummingbirds have a extra food during their migration. It's mm -hmm. a, a really help for them. Excellent. Sorry. Thanks, Daniela. Anybody want to add to that? Okay. Let's see. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to add to that actually, because it's such a great opportunity to share with people uh, ways of conserving birds. So can you, can you share with them, how should you make your hummingbird nectar? Does anybody know how the hummingbird nectar should be made? Mm, well, I can. Oh, okay, Miguel, if you want. No, 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 Daniela, you keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, we have here, it's uh, one part of sugar uh, for four of water. No, one part of one of four is for, of sugar. So three parts will be water and one part will be sugar. And yeah, just use sugar, this white sugar. I don't know how you call it in English. Uh, white sugar, <laughs> yep. White sugar. <laughs> yeah, other kinds of sugar, honey, that's not good for hummingbirds. Only white sugar. Great. How about the red dye? Should we use red dye? No, <laughs> no, that's terrible for hummingbirds. Okay. Don't, don't use it. Okay, let me give you the stump the ex expert question. Why is it bad for hummingbirds? I continue or someone else wants to ask. You're doing You're great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, because this has like many, uh, I don't know the name in English, like it's not natural and it has like another, a lot of 
co eh, conservadores, I forgot any in English, like... Mm, oh, preservatives. Preservatives that are bad for hummingbirds and they put colorant and these all artificial things that at the end will not give a good, like, they will not Reassuring. be... Yeah. Yeah, I forgot that word, sorry. Like, they, they will not be healthy so it's better to use natural things and that's better for everyone also for us right yeah all that artificial things are like but at the end great good job thank you we didn't stump them yet you guys so keep working at it um the next question what bird migrates the farthest i know that one all right Good go question. for it jordan uh, the the arc took a turn Ooh, can they, you give us more details? Yeah, so they're this beautiful white bird with this orange bill, and they fly almost around the globe between their spring and fall migration because they fly from the Arctic and the North Pole to the South Pole one way, and then they do it again for their second migration. So I forget how far it was in their lifetime, but it's it's something like many, many times around the world. Um, and they fly the farthest of any, any individual animal. That's great. Okay. Good job. We had those questions came from Sam and Buzz and Cindy. So thank you guys for putting your questions out to these guys. You haven't stumped them yet though. So you need to keep going. Um, Melinda, who is doing our running our program behind the scenes, could you put up a video question? And these questions, I think it's going to come up in Spanish. So we'll translate it for you, Jordan, because we, you know, that wouldn't be fair unless you speak Spanish, let me know. Um, but we'll put that video up. Hola, soy Mariana, soy de Saltillo, Coahuila, México. Y mi pregunta es, ¿por qué cambian con frecuencia el nombre científico de las aves? Gracias. Okay, Daniela or Miguel, do you want to translate that question for Jordan? Yeah, the, she, she asking about why the synthesis name changed so quickly and why, why they changed. The scientific you want to answer name. that question, Jordan? Uh, I, Sure. Yeah. So, so birds typically have two different types of names. They have the scientific name, which is in Latin, and they have a genus and a species name. And that's very much like a serial number or a social security number. It's something that's, or a license plate on a car. It's meant to be this very stable, does not change. Everyone can reference it and know what bird we're talking about. Birds also have common names. And so, for example, the bird in my background, in English, it's called a black-throated blue warbler. But in Spanish, it might have a different name. And so those common names can change pretty regularly. And a lot of that is based off of uh, scientists, ornithologists, that are looking at the relationship of birds. So if a bird, if all of a sudden... Uh, science said, this isn't actually a warbler, it's a sparrow, then we might change its name. If that's not the case, <laughs> but that might be a reason for a name change. Another reason that birds might have a name change is because someone said, we could name it better. Maybe there's a better description that the bird could have for its name. Uh, maybe again, going back to the science, there's a better reason for a bird to have a more accurate name. But birds do tend to have name changes. And luckily, <laughs> between apps or field guides, or just us being able to talk about birds, we can still continue to, to know what, what bird we're talking about. Excellent. Would any of you like to uh, respond to the the comment about the bird names in Spanish? Yes. Um, for example, mm -hmm. one of the most... Channel, channel, uh, voy, voy a hacerlo en español porque la pregunta en español. Um, de las cosas más 
desafiantes que tenemos en América Latina es que cada país tiene un nombre para la misma ave. Y esto, primero, las personas en los países, niveles en, en la cultura, las personas indígenas, en las ciudades, en, el, en los campos, pueden llamar a un mismo pájaro de tres maneras distintas estando en un solo país. Y eso es realmente un desafío para poner todo junto y encontrar un, un nombre en común. Lo que hemos aceptado es... Uh oh, we lost one of our experts. That was fast. Um, Daniela, he was talking about, you know, the different names, especially names that come from indigenous groups. And I know in Mexico, there's actually even a booklet called <laughs> the common names of um, the common names of Mexico's birds by region. And sometimes some of the species have five, six, seven different names. Uh, do you want to continue what Miguel was saying? Um, yeah, uh, yes, he was saying like in, it's in Latin America, in Mexico, the culture is so diverse in different areas that we have like really different names. And sometimes they put they associate it with like sounds they made or with what they do. And people like are really creative and want like associated with that. And it's really beautiful. Like these many, for example, in Mexico, we have uh, different cultures in the areas. So these cultures name it, uh, thinking about their culture, but also about how they sound and the region and everything. They associate everything. And this is like a really, really rich, thing to have and it's really beautiful. Miguel is here. I don't know if his sound is better right now. Yeah, but I like uh, back. <laughs> Did that cover? Did you want to add anything else now, Miguel? Uh, simplemente eso, todos pueden llamar a las aves de forma común, como les parezca, como quieran, como sea en tu localidad. Y estamos contentos de que las aves tengan miles de nombres porque también nos ayudan a entender cómo se relacionan con las personas. So, everybody can call in common names uh, as they want. Just respect the sentences name and we, we, we are really appreciate the creative, the creative to different name for the same bird. All right. Good job. All right, everybody. So, Marcus has a question for you. Marcus wants to know, do birds use the same nest every year? even if they have a different partner? Ooh, but silence that, from the experts. <laughs> I need to think about that one. So I know that, I, again, I'm in Washington, DC, so I I will speak for the, air, for the birds in my region, because I know with, with Daniela and Miguel, it may be different in those countries. But for my area, it's very species dependent. So some birds will come back to the same nest box uh, year after year or the same backyard year after year. But some birds, they do something different every year. <laughs> so it, it's hard to answer your question because we should pick one bird and then I can answer it. But I can't answer all of the birds because that's, that's a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of birds to, to answer. I, yeah, I will let like to add something to that. Or for example, raptors, uh, they usually, well, here in Mexico, I have uh, seen some raptors that they, they return to the same part to nest, like they use the same place or they reuse, for example, ospreys, reuse like that, the bases, I don't know, it's how they call, like the platforms they put for them, uh, they reuse these platforms. But as Jordan was saying, it depends a lot of, of the species, right? So. But yeah, some birds reuse nests, nests and some other ones like do new things and whatever they, 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 they feel is better. All right, good. Miguel, do you have anything to add? Yeah, oh. and, and that not only happened with raptors, Daniela. I know members that return to the nest every year. And um, for example, others, uh, others, other kind of bird 
don't build any nests. All other other birds are like a parasite and go to the nest to the other species, put the eggs in that nest and then leave. And they never know their parents, but some way them they you can see all these species in a big flocks. Um, they are together. How they back to the family? I don't know, but uh, it's, it's very interesting. Great, thank you. I must depend on if their nest lasts from year to year. Do they fall apart with the weather? <laughs> thank you. All right, there's an interest question. This isn't a stump the expert question. Uh, asking about those common birds of Mexico. I know I have a booklet of them. Daniela, do you know where people could find the common birds of Mexico names? Is that on Conabio's website or do you have any idea where people might find that list? Let me look for it because I'm not sure if it's available, but I, if I will check it and it, if it's available, I will let the link read there. I have to check it. Okay, sounds good, thanks. Um, Melinda, could we go to another video question? And again, this will be in, I think it's in Spanish again. Uh, so we'll have Daniela or Miguel translate it. Mata, vive en Venezuela. Tengo cinco años. Y, y una pregunta. ¿Por qué las aves vuelan? ¿Por qué las aves están? ¿Y por qué las aves tienen colores? ¿Y por qué? Y hace una pregunta. ¿Por qué los expertos estudian unas aves? ¿Y por qué otras no? Wow. She asked a lot. I'm going to start with the last one because I thought that was a rather different question. Like I've never heard anybody ask that before. Um, so way to go, Aranza. Um, those are amazing questions. You're going to be a biologist someday. But her last question was, why do researchers study some birds, but not others? What a good question. Who wants to take that on? I just want to echo that she is amazing. I, I, I want to talk to her and hear what she has to say about birds. Um, in regards to her question, though, that, again, has so many different answers. Some birds are really common and have a really large population, which makes them really easy to study because they can be uh, have a lot of samples. A lot of different individual birds can have contribute samples to data or they're easy to find, they're easy to catch for banding. Uh, some birds are really important and chosen because of their weight, especially right now, there's so much tracking information happening, uh, things like modus towers or geotags where the birds actually wear almost like a little backpack that then tracks their migration and movements. And so you don't wanna put a really heavy backpack on a hummingbird for example. So some birds are chosen because they're large enough to carry that backpack. Um, so a lot has to go, uh, a lot is determined by what the question the scientist is asking. Great. Thank you. Anybody else have comments? Yeah, thank you, Joran. Uh, Aranza is my nephew. I, I love her. She, I know she's going to be a uh, bird watching in the future. Um, one of the, 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 um, the strong, important thing when you decide to study bird is have data to, to analyze. It. So that's what Jordan say. Some, some, somebody have a lot of data. Other have so, uh, weird behaviors are so hard to find. Um, others are so common that people just ignore it. And others have so many colors and so many uh, beautiful, beautiful plumage. So they attract the attention of the people. And, and when they have so many attention, also they have money to research. But uh, others can be with dark colors, these weird behaviors, and it's, it's hard to, to get money for these species. But the, the most important thing here is that every species of bird need uh, more information and 
yeah, we love beers. We need to know everything about all of them. <laughs> Thanks, Miguel. She's adorable. <laughs> no, no question about that. Daniela, did you want to add anything? No, I'm also what Jordan and Miguel says, said. Um, yeah, some birds have more information, some less, and it's important to, yes, we have studied more some birds, but it's important to have information of every bird. And yes, it will depend a lot of, of the question that you are making. And yes, and sometimes the charismatic birds, as Miguel said, help a lot to bring uh, money to, to the projects, right? But it's important to have information of, of all of them. Um, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Daniela. All right, good job. So we have another question from Maria. Maria, maybe you could let us know where you're from. Maria says, That's, this is a good question. Um, are there any other birds that fly in place like hummingbirds? So I know that some birds like American kestrels can hover, which is comes across as flying in place but I don't actually know of any other birds that are quite as special flyers as hummingbirds because hummingbirds can fly backwards and they can fly really fast. And again, that hovering at a flower is really special because that's how they are able to drink all of the nectar from the flower. Any, any others have any ideas, any other species that can hover like a hummingbird that you know of? Um. I I I I think in uh, Jordan has right that just only other raptors can you know stay in the air for a little bit, but hummingbirds are special. The 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 composition of their fly is is inspires us to do machines like for for example helicopters, and the fly of the bird inspires us to do. Uh, for example, airplanes. So I think the, the, the unique of hummingbird is reflecting in, in our helicopters around the globe, around the globe, they aspire to, to do that. Thanks, Miguel. Daniela, anything there in Mexico that hovers like a, like a hummingbird that's not a hummingbird? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I know that also some kingfishers, kingfishers can stay in a place like when they are going to, to go to the water. Um, but that's it. Yeah, hummingbirds are unique. Well, and, and as Jordan and Miguel says, raptors can stay also like kites. But yeah, that's that's all I have. <laughs> okay, so maybe uh, so it sounds like hummingbirds, and then all the some of those birds that are hunting maybe above water or above a field can at least hover, but maybe not do all the acrobatics of a hummingbird. Great. All right, good. So we are almost at our time. You guys out there, you're going to have to come up with some harder questions for this team. So if you think of any, uh, we might have a little time at the end, but what I'm going to do is go to a fun question from Samuel Lopez. Thanks, Samuel. I know you've been watching today. And he wants to know if you could be a migratory bird, what kind of, what migratory bird would you like to be? Who'd like to start? I have to admit that these are the questions that stump me. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe some, well, you did stump them. <laughs> Cause there's, there's over 10,000 species of birds in the world. So picking a favorite or even picking a favorite migratory bird, a favorite migratory bird in the Western hemisphere, I'm trying to whittle it down, but it's hard. <laughs> Okay. Do you want to think about it or do you want to consider yourself stumped? I will, I will consider myself stumped. Okay. Some, well, you stumped Jordan. <laughs> How about Miguel? Are you stumped? <laughs> no, 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 I think I have, I always have a fire, favorite migratory bird. Uh, this is the Wimbrel. It's a short bird species. They, they, it's not the longest migrate, they don't have the longest migration, but they they travel across the American flyway. And, and I think this is a good species to represent the, the connection between our countries. Um, one of the species I remember in my first field trips, see Wimbers and then back to the internet, 
uh, where this migratory bird come from. And when I realize all the travel they, they do, I just in love with were with, with, with birds. But my species specialization is passerine birds. I never work with wind birds. I, I hope in the in the future. Yeah, I know. I thought you were gonna say a water thrush or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Miguel. How about you, Daniela? Do you have a favorite or are you going to be stumped? Yeah, it's a difficult question. I, I think I also admire every migratory bird, day, bird, bird, sorry, bird. <laughs> they are fantastic, but yeah, it's difficult. Um, I would like to be maybe a kingfisher, but I maybe if I have to migrate, um, I will be a raptor because it seems that they don't have that much, much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and they, oh, so, so you're looking at safety, right? Yeah, yeah. But I think being a migrat migratory yeah. bird bird will be great to to meet these wonderful places and see it all above. It's above, yeah. Uh -huh. To get yeah. to visit so many places and to get to fly so far, even if it's yeah. a, a hazardous and and challenging journey, right? Yeah, it's beautiful. All right. <laughs> Let me check the questions and see if anybody else has a stumper for you guys. I'm not seeing any more um, stump the expert questions. How about, let me ask you one that I don't think will stump you, but I think is a good way to leave the discussion. If you were to tell people one way that they could help migratory birds, what would that be? That you can. There is something for everyone, whether you are Miguel's five-year-old niece or an 85 year old grandma, uh, there is something that you can do today to help birds, even if it's just telling someone else that you love birds. Uh, there are other things that you can do that, that do require an action item. Maybe you wanna treat your windows to help prevent birds from flying into them. Maybe you wanna make sure that your cat or dog is always on a leash so that they stay safe and the birds stay safe. But even if you just tell someone that you love birds and maybe you have a fun fact, that helps birds. Okay, great. Thanks, Jordan. That's nice. Who wants to go next? For me, um, for me, everything starts when you start watching birds. Um, at the moment, you start watch a uh, bird in your backyard, in national parks, or whatever you are, pay attention. Be, uh, look what they are doing, uh, what they are singing, uh, um, and that is uh, that gonna start with more curiosity in yourself about the birds, and 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 then you're gonna have more inspiration to find more information, and and, and in this way, when you get more knowledge about birds, you can share that knowledge with your family, your friends. So, I think. The major of the people that are watching us today are, not that easy. are people related with, with birds. But uh, right. for queuing up my next video. But, <laughs> yeah. But for for that people that this is his first time uh, relating with bird field, start start easy. Just go to your backyard and start watching bird. All the questions and all the information come later. Thanks, Miguel. That's wonderful. And Daniela. Yeah, I, I will add to that. Thank you. And that, well, uh, it's important if you want to take care of birds, like to consider all that, that is around you. Like if you make good actions in every, in every day of your life, uh, you are helping birds, like uh, using as, as uh, these simple actions to help birds, like uh, don't use like a lot of plastic or plastic that is of one use and also take care of native plants uh, know your native plants because these native plants help a lot a lot the birds and the insects and and also like take care of your pets uh, don't put them outside like the cats like Jordan was saying and, and also that dogs sometimes we don't see how they affect uh, um, the environment, right? When they, we take them to the beach, uh, take them with um, Correa, I forgot that in English, like 
uh, don't take be, be always responsible of, of what you are doing, what you are eating, and with simple actions you can help birds. That will be my my message. Thanks, Daniela. And I'm also um, into the no plastics. Uh, I've been trying for months to get rid of the plastics and reduce our plastic use. It's a tough one. Uh, so much comes in plastic. And for those of you out there listening, can one of you explain why plastics are bad for birds? Anybody want to go for that one? Yeah, sorry. Can you repeat that again, Susan? Yeah, Daniela was talking about not using plastics, but what do plastics have to do with birds? Why should we try to reduce our plastic use? Yeah, uh, plastic uh, with the time becoming microplastic. Um, that uh, entered to our environment and in different forms, uh, starting with our food, with the health of the environment with, where we live. Um, birds really don't recognize the, the form of the plastic, for example, in, in water. Um, sometimes uh, plastic can smell like the, the food they eat, so they can confuse about that. So our responsibility, our responsibility, responsibility with plastic is huge and it's very important to take care about that every day. Um, you can choose uh, reusable um, uh, um, tools, uh, like a EFTA bottle, we have an EFTA bottle, um, and different kind of thing. Band the, the straws, for example. Um, yeah, we, we have a lot of information because uh, plastic pollution was our conservation team in 2019, so you can find more information on our website about that and invite you to... to get a more free plastic life. Definitely. Thanks, Miguel. Anybody want to add any final words before we take off to our next presentation? I'll just add uh, with the plastics too, you know, it's just pollution in general. Uh, I, I've seen a plover nest that actually used plastics in is like pebbles, the microplastics. So they didn't eat it, but they still had it in their nest. And it's so sad to see these cute little cotton balls on toothpick chicks running around with plastic. So it's, it's a huge problem, but one that we can, again, take action on and you can do something. So just as Miguel said, ask questions, keep learning and keep sharing birds. Thanks. I want to thank you all. You've been amazing experts and we hope to have you back again soon. Uh, Miguel and I are going to move on to the next presentation. So Daniela and Jordan, we'll let you go back to whatever you were doing before. And thanks again for joining us for Stump the Experts. All right, Miguel, are we ready for a day in the life of a bird? I have yeah, the presentation or are you going to do it? No, you, you can, it's better your internet, thank you. All right, I'm gonna share this. So what we're gonna talk about next is we're gonna talk about, you know, what do birds do during their day? Um, and I'm gonna remind you that if you're out there watching, you can watch us on birddaylive.com and you can put your comments in the chat box. You do have to log into that chat box to see any other comments. So if it just looks like a white box up there, with nothing going on, there are actually people in that box chatting, um, but you have to get in there to do it. So you have to log in and enter your comments. So please do. We enjoy hearing from you and we've been sharing these comments. So uh, join us in the chat box. Uh, you can also see us on various Facebook pages at Environment for the Americas, the Partners in Flight, the Programa de Aves Urbanas and the Caribbean Bird Festival's Facebook pages. Thanks so much for joining us today. And we're going to talk now about a day in the life of an owl. Uh, owls are amazing birds, and I know everybody loves them so much. They're very large and noticeable, and there are big owls, but there are actually medium-sized owls, like this beautiful barn owl. And then there are actually very small owls. So owls come in all sizes. And I think we tend to think of the bigger owls just because they're so much more noticeable. 
And they also come in different colors, even though I'd say most of them are the brownish, but there are also white owls like the snowy owl. And then there are very striped owls. So once you start looking at owls, you might start to notice many different characteristics of them. Usually when an owl starts its day, you know, it's almost night. That's not for all the owls. And that doesn't mean you wouldn't ever see an owl out during the day. But a lot of the owls are known for being uh, more, of, more out at, at dawn and dusk, which is called crepuscular. Or they might be diurnal, which is active during the day. Or they might be nocturnal, which is active at night. This is a beautiful owl and they fly so silently. And one of the ways that they do that is that their feathers actually are kind of, you might think of it as furry uh, and that they have these extra extensions on their feathers that actually make them fly quite quietly so that when they're flying and looking for prey, the prey can't hear them. You also notice the big disc on the face around the eyes. They always, they have this, many of them have this big circle around their eyes. And that's something that helps them to capture sound because they're eating animals that are quite small often, not always, some of them might be bigger and they're searching for them. So often they'll use the trapping the sound uh, into their ears, which are actually located behind the eye uh, so that they can catch their prey. And if you've ever known, how does an owl eat its prey? They are quite the predators. In fact, they're such a big help to us because one of the things that they do is they can help to reduce the number of rodents or mice and rats that are in a place. Uh, so the more owls you have, the better, because that means the less mice and rats that you'll have. Uh, they take these rats and mice and they, they eat them all. They eat every little bit of it. This is a silent hunter, the snowy owl, and it's quite camouflaged, you can see, which means that it's blending in with its background. So it's white feathers help it not to be seen when it's flying in the snow and when it's hunting. And here it goes, you know, going after this poor little mouse, uh, hunting it, um, and it flies. Again, if you look at those wings, they almost look like snow themselves. They look soft and fluffy, and that's what helps them, again, to fly so quietly. Now, what does an owl do after it's eaten that whole animal? What is it doing here? If you take a look at these, at what's coming out of its mouth, if, put it in the chat box if you think you know what this is, that this bird is regurgitating. It's a little, doesn't looks a little disgusting, doesn't it? And owls do this. Here's a great horned owl doing that. And here's another owl doing it. And here's even a chick doing it. So you don't even have to be an adult owl to need to regurgitate. Here is a burrowing owl regurgitating this and what they're called pellets. Well, what's in a pellet and why do the owls need to regurgitate it? Thanks from Alana Johnson, who said, yes, it's a pellet. If you were to find one of these pellets and dissect it, you would find so many little bones and parts of the animals that that owl ate. This is actually from an owl dissection that we did with a classroom. We did it virtually and we took all the bones out of the pellet and we put them on a piece of paper and glued them down and we actually had the complete skeleton of some rodent you can see all the rib bones and the jaw bones and the pelvic bones and then there were even extra bones in there so this owl actually ate more than one rodent and ate a couple other things plus it had fur in there and feathers hmm so what did it eat when it got feathers in its in its pellet don't know about that one, but definitely owls are voracious eaters. And again, they can really help to reduce the number of rodents in an area. And if you get a chance to do an owl dissection, this is what you could find. So when you're out looking for owls, you know, they're often very quiet. They spend a lot of time just sitting. Uh, so one of the things that you have to do is look very car carefully in the trees. And you can see that like the snowy owl was camouflaged in the white snow. This owl is quite camouflaged in the trees. And perhaps that's what the striping is about. I don't know. 
Some of them will be out and more visible and perched out in the, in the open, but not all of them. And then again, some of them live in grasslands. So they're found in quite different habitats too. Some of them actually live in burrows. The burrowing owl lives in burrows that are dug by uh, prairie dogs. And then they go into these prairie dog holes to nest. So in the grasslands, that might be an owl that you'll see. And why is that? Well, there are no trees. So they need to find another way to nest. They've evolved in these grasslands and that's how they work, uh, how they find their nesting sites. And so now I'm going to turn it over to you, Miguel, to talk about the day in the life of a hummingbird. Thank you so much, Susan. Now I'm going to turn it in Spanish. Um, <clears throat> Bienvenidos a la vida de un colibri migratorio. Los superhéroes de, creo yo, los superhéroes de todos los migratorios por su tamaño tan pequeño y por los recorridos tan impresionantes que, que realizan. Y los colibrís, muchas personas lo asocian con eh, esos animales tan diminutos y frágiles, pero realmente estos, eh, estos organismos son unos superhéroes de verdad. En esta foto podemos ver al colibrí migratorio, Celaphorus rufus, que más adelante vamos a, a, a ver un poco de su ruta migratoria. Y quisiera preguntar, ¿Saben ustedes cuál es la, la ruta de migración más larga de los colibrís? Por favor, coloca la respuesta dentro del chat y vamos a responderla más adelante. Siguiente, por favor. Un día en la vida de un colibrí. Adelante. Los colibrís tienen diferentes formas. Una de sus características principales es el, la forma del pico, el hongado, y pueden ser picos tan cortos, pero tan largos como el que vemos en esta foto. Este es el coli, colibrí pico espada, y se encuentra solamente en Sudamérica, y es uno de los colibrís más hermosos y extraños que tenemos. A ver, algunos de ustedes se puede imaginar cómo este colibrí puede alimentar a sus pichones cuando, tienen, cuando tiene un nido. Pues lo hace volando. Cuando él va en busca de flores, llena sus gargantas de néctar y sostiene el vuelo justo encima del, del nido para poder completar en sincronía, introducir su pico en el pico del pichón y poder pasar toda, todo el néctar que ha recolectado. Y los colibríes como este enfrentan muchos desafíos desde que nacen hasta que mueren. Adelante. Otros como este pueden, pueden observar que tienen una parte muy característica en su cuerpo. Se llaman gorgueras. Es esta región entre la garganta y el pecho que particularmente está muy colorida y los machos de los colibris utilizan para atraer las hembras. En este caso, la gorguera es de color rubí, y estamos observando un pico con un colibrí con un pequeño pico, pero además con una gorguera hermosa sostenido en el aire. Y vamos, vamos a, a practicar cómo, cómo es sostenerse en el aire mientras que te alimentas. Siguiente, por favor. A ver... Para mantenerse en el aire, el corazón de los colibríes tiene que latir extremadamente fuerte y rápido durante muy corto tiempo. Es por eso que el corazón de un colibrí es uno de los órganos más grandes dentro de su cuerpo, porque este, este órgano, el corazón, se debe encargar de hacer fluir toda la sangre para que llegue a, todo, a todos los músculos del cuerpo del colibrí y pueda mantenerse en vuelo. Y para ello necesita recursos como néctar e insectos para poder alimentarse y estar en vuelo sostenido. Así que vamos a hacer una pequeña práctica. Siguiente, por favor. Y quiero que todos me digan qué tan difícil es volar como un colibrí. Aquí vemos que el colibrí cuando encuentra una flor se posiciona sobre ella y vamos a simular este, este movimiento. Quiero que todos hagan este movimiento de sus cuerpos y luego vamos a abatir. De esa manera, 
en la siguiente lámina, por favor, estamos en posición para, para batir las alas y va a dar 15 segundos. Todo lo que puedan batir en 15 segundos, ustedes van a hacer. Vamos a tener un reloj hacia atrás de 15 segundos. Ustedes tienen que batir las alas todo, todo lo que puedan. Y van a contar cuántos pueden hacer en todo ese tiempo. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez, once, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. Wow. 40. Yo hice 40. Quisiera escuchar acá, Susan, ¿puedes decirme qué está respondiendo a las personas? Eh, ¿Cuánto lograron batir sus alas en esos 15 segundos? Y luego vamos a revelar la respuesta de ¿Cuánto en realidad baten las aves, eh, las alas, los colibris por segundo? ¿Hay alguna respuesta en el público? Haven't gotten an answer on it. I know people are watching because we're getting responses here. So we have Teresa from St. Louis. We have Allison from California. We have Josh, uh, Alvana. So um, they didn't tell us how fast they can fly like a hummingbird, though. And I think Miss Qualls class and some others are on. Ok, podemos esperar un poco más, pero para el conocimiento de todos, un colibrí puede batir sus alas hasta 60 veces por segundo. Yo, aquí en vivo con ustedes, solo pude batir mis alas 30 veces en 15 segundos. Es decir, si yo fuese un colibrí, fuese el colibrí más lento de todos. Y no podría well, alimentarme con un vuelo the... sostenido. Entonces, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh -huh. I had a Jorge who came in with 26. How many did you say you had? I, I, I took 30. Oh, okay. Jorge needs to speed up. 30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excelente. Entonces, pensemos en lo cansado que pueden estar los colibrís cada vez que tienen que ir a alimentarse. Que, se, que viajan estas largas distancias y nosotros estamos destruyendo mucho hábitat, pero hay otras personas que están conscientes de eso y proveen eh, jardines amigables con las aves, en donde, por ejemplo, en esta foto podemos observar un colibrí visitando nuestro jardín. Los colibrís, como otros animales, son polinizadores, lo que quiere decir que diariamente visitan diferentes recursos y al visitar estos recursos florales pueden llevar en su pico el polen de estas flores. De esa manera ocurre la polinización de, de, del recurso que ellos se alimentan y ayudan a crear más, más hábitat. Pero los polinizadores están en grave peligro. Muchas personas utilizan pesticidas o eliminan completamente la cobertura vegetal de nuestros lugares. Es por ello que cuando veamos un colibrí pensemos en lo increíble que es es moverse a más de 60 batidos de ala por segundo y que lo están haciendo durante todo el día. La cosa es, ¿qué pasa con los colibrís cuando duermen? Adelante. Acá vemos otro ejemplo de un colibrí alimentándose de flores de salvia nativas en nuestro jardín. Estas flores son sus favoritas. Las, for, las flores favoritas de los colibríes son aquellas que tienen una forma tubular que, que ayudan a que el pico pueda entrar perfectamente. Otros tienen que acceder a, a las flores de otras maneras, a veces por abajo, a veces eh, en, el pico es tan grande o es tan di diferente de la flor que no pueden polinizarlo. Entonces, plantar una variedad de, de flores nativas en nuestro jardín es importante para obtener también una riqueza de especie en nuestros lugares. Siguiente, por favor. Ah, acá eh, vemos al colibrí rufo, una de las especies eh, migratorias de nuestro Día Mundial de las Aves Migratorias. El año pasado, se la fue los rufos. Eh, es uno de los, migra de, los, de los colibrís migratorios en el mundo. Actualmente sabemos que existen como unos 300 especies de colibrí en, en todo el mundo y muy pocas de ellas son migratorias. Esta que ustedes ven en la pantalla lo es 
Y vamos, más adelante, en la, siguiente present, en la siguiente lámina, por favor, vamos a conocer otras especies de en, colibríes migratorios, como este que también está en la costa, este de, en la costa oeste de Estados Unidos y migra hasta México. Y encontramos esa parte hermosa de su cabeza, las gorgueras de color rubí o de color zafiro. ¿Y cuál es la ruta de, de migración de estos colibríes? ¿Podemos pasar a la siguiente lámina, por favor? Ups. Eh, est estaba un poco confundido con, con la historia, pero ahora vemos que los colibríes también tienen muchas actividades durante su día. Durante su día y, ante, y antes de empezar la migración, los colibríes tienen que hacer una limpieza de su plumaje muy, muy detallado. Para ellos toman... Eh, baños en los ríos o en los bebederos que podamos tener en nuestro jardín. Acá vemos un colibrí que primero llega al agua, empapa todo su cuerpo de agua y luego le toca acicalarse. Es la manera en la que los colibríes pueden eliminar el néctar que queda en el pico, insectos que están sobre su plumaje y sobre todo hacer que su plumaje esté todos los días igual de lustrado, igual de este, hermoso para presentarse en, en los casos en los que tenga que reproducirse. Adelante, por favor. Y esta es una foto muy extraña de los colibríes. Y quisiera saber si alguien en el público sabe lo que significa torpor. Pero por la foto deben, deben saber o, o deben imaginarse que está relacionado al sueño. Y pues sí, los colibríes tienen un mecanismo en el que prácticamente apagan todo su cuerpo, hasta el punto de que algunos cuando van a dormir eh, se quedan dormidos y solamente se quedan guindados por las patas, y esto es muy raro de observar, pero si lo logran fotografiar, no se preocupen, el colibrí no está muerto, el colibrí solamente está descansando, solamente que es, tiene un sueño tan profundo por todo lo que hemos conversado, un corazón latiendo todo el día, buscando, eh, buscando flores por toda la región donde tiene su territorio, y además después de las largas migraciones, no es de, no es de sorprenderse que los colibríes duerman de esta manera. Pero también lo hacen cuando existen cambios en el ambiente, como el invierno, o durante la noche, cuando la temperatura baja, los colibríes no encuentran ningún recurso para alimentarse, es entonces que eh, realizan el torpor, para quedarse tranquilos y esperar al día siguiente durante el día para poder este, alimentarse. Y en este mecanismo, como les estaba comentando, todos los signos vitales del colibrí se llevan a su mínima expresión. Siguiente. Por eso, eh, los colibríes a veces eh, pueden, no son los únicos que duermen, Vuelan de, eh, duermen de cabeza están los murciélagos que también son polinizadores y cumplen un papel muy similar a los colibríes ellos son los polinizadores de la noche, son los amigos de los colibríes durante el, la noche mientras que los colibríes están polinizando y recorriendo sus territorios durante el día los murciélagos hacen el mismo trabajo en la noche y solo una pequeña similitud aquí vemos un murciélago a, a agarrado de solo una pata mientras que el colibrí está en dos. ¿Por qué? El torpor hace que sus músculos simplemente se engarroten o se dejen de mover o queden en esa posición. Y luego cuando se restituye el sistema eh, vital, eh, toda, la toda la sangre y los fluidos empiezan a, a continuar nuevamente y él puede volver a moverse. Pero nunca se despega de sus patitas. Siguiente, por favor. Y acá finalmente les estaba comentando sobre la ruta del colibrí rufo o celaforus rufo, que además eh, este es uno de los colibríes de larga distancia, es decir, que viaja tan lejos como Alaska y el oeste de Estados Unidos y Canadá hasta su lugar de invernada en México. Y para realizar este viaje toma dos rutas principalmente. Primero, al norte cuando los colibríes se, eh, 
se reproducen, tienen sus pichones, empieza esta larga travesía en julio, agosto y septiembre y bajan por toda la cordillera montañosa del oeste de Estados Unidos hasta el desierto y montañas en México. Permanecen en estos lugares agosto, septiembre, febrero y luego cuando las temporadas, eh, las estaciones en, en estos lugares empiezan a cambiar, el recurso empieza a escasear y el invierno retrocede en el norte, es momento de partir de regreso y lo hacen por una línea a través del Pacífico y retornan increíblemente a los mismos lugares cada año. Así que si tu colibrí desaparece un día de tu jardín y no lo ves por mucho tiempo, espera, espera hacia esa misma fecha el próximo año y vas a ver que tus colibríes van a retornar y van a retornar con muchas historias. Y celebremos esos colibrí que retornan cada año a nuestros patios porque son símbolo de, de ser unos grandes guerreros y de ser unos grandes eh, aves migratorias para destacar siempre. Bueno, con esto creo que es la última presentación. Bueno, Jorge, invitamos a todos a compartir cuál es tu historia con las aves migratorias. Queremos saber las diferentes eh, anécdotas cómicas o interesantes que hayas tenido con un ave en tu localidad. Regresa un ave migratoria todos los días a tu, a tu patio. Eh, ¿Dejaste de ver aves migratorias en tu localidad? Todas esas historias puedes compartirla con nosotros en nuestras redes sociales y vamos a destacarlas en el futuro. Thank you, Miguel. That was excellent. And we have a question from Hugo Campo. And Hugo's asking, ¿Puede ser que la máxima distancia de migración sea en cinco kilómetros? Cinco mil kilómetros. O oh, cinco mil kilómetros pueden ser casi dos países. Entonces creo que para el caso de Celasporos Rufos, exactamente esa es más o menos la ruta de migración. Sin embargo, pueden haber algunos colibríes que están justo, justo en el norte de Alaska y van muy, 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 muy al sur de México. Entonces, esa distancia puede ser más grande o menor. Yes, and I think that the longest known migration for a hummingbird is the rufous hummingbird, which can do an 8,000 mile round trip migration. That's miles, not kilometers. And it go, this hummingbird has known to nest in Alaska but then over winter in Florida. So all the way across the United States, quite a long migration. All right. So I think, um, Miguel, I don't see any other questions right now, uh, but I thought we could show people a little, oh, we do have one comment from Allison who says that she's visited or she's seen a Rufus hummingbird drinking nectar from her hummingbird feeder. So thanks, Allison, for sharing that. And we're going to show just a quick video of owls regurgitating their pellets. And then we'll go do Zumba. Lots of birds in the background too, huh? <laughs> Here you go. Thank you, Melinda. That's probably enough to get the picture of, of how an owl regurgitates its pellet. So that, that concludes our day in the life of an owl and a hummingbird. Thanks for your questions and your comments. Uh, we appreciate that. Do you want to bring Laura back on, Miguel? Yeah, Laura, are you here? Yeah. Well, next section is the, the second round of Zumba Like a Bird with Laura from Trinidad Tobago, our 
Caribbean coordinator for World Migratory Beer Day, Laura. Welcome to enjoy the, the, the next session and we are happy to have you here again. Thank you. I'm excited to be back for round two of Zumba. <laughs> All right, well, um, okay, let me just uh, share my music and we could start. All right. So um, I hope you all can hear. Ooh. I hope you all can hear me really well. Um, so welcome to this session. So we're back out again. We're going to dance like birds. Birds have different ways they can move. They shake. They can jump. They fly. They soar. So we're going to do all of that while dancing. Right? Trying to be a little creative with it. So just ensure you have a nice clear space so you don't bump into anything. All right. Have comfy shoes on. Comfortable clothing. Have some water because we don't want you to get dehydrated. So and a towel just in case it gets pretty hot. Okay. So um, oh, another thing. Um, don't don't feel too intimidated by the moves. Um, if you, you're not getting something that I'm doing, you feel free to freestyle. You can spread your wings. You can turn around. You can, you can freestyle, do whatever you feel comfortable doing. Okay? It's all about just having fun, learning about the birds and celebrating birds. So before we start, we're going to just do some light stretches to get those muscles warmed up like the birds. So you can fly like birds, right? So... Let's get in the stretch. gonna get into picking up the pace a little bit to warm up so let's go <laughs>
right, great job. We're still warming up, okay? So I'm gonna give you all some cues for the next song. Right, so we'll move forward. Fly, forward, fly, and then soar. Okay? So come forward, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, and soar. All right? It's going to be great. And don't forget, we smile a lot during this. So let's go. Have fun.
All right, you should be warm. Your muscles ready to fly like a bird, right? Okay, if you need to take a sip of water, go ahead and do that. And moving on to the next song. All right. So while you catch your breath a little bit, I'll give you some cues for this one. So this one was inspired by the Upland Sun Piper. Moves its neck like this. Okay. All right. Then it does a bob, a tail bob. So we're gonna try to mimic that best way we can. So we're gonna two, three, four, and then we're gonna turn. Okay. One, two, three, four. And the other side. Two, four, and two. One, two, three, four. One more time. Okay. One two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, last one, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. All right. Don't worry, you, you all got this. You got this. Great job. All right. So take a wipe if you're feeling a little bit hot now. Have a sip of water. And we're going on to the other song. Okay. Okay. It's a bit humid where I am right now. It's raining actually. This morning I had bright sun. Now it's raining. All right. So um, previously, the previous session before, Miguel spoke about the hummingbirds. So now we're going to dance like a hummingbird, right? So he had you all flap to see how, how fast you can flap. If, if you can flap your wings as fast as a hummingbird. What we're going to do, 
this to make our hummingbirds, okay? And we're going to replicate how hummingbirds can move forward, back, up, down. Well, for us, this way, left and right, forward, back. So we're going to go as fast as we could, okay? All right. And then we're going to try to hover too, okay? All right. Can't imagine how hummingbirds flap their wings so quickly. All right. <laughs> okay, so right on to the next song. Take five seconds if you need it. Get a sip. Okay. Remember, if you are thirsty already, that means you're getting you're already dehydrated. So ensure to take sips in between. Okay, so the next song. I'll give you all some more um, cues. It's very easy. So this one is inspired by the vultures. And you, have, you all heard about the vultures in, the, in, um, in an earlier session, OK? So you probably learned how they soar high up in the skies. And kind of you, and just, you could imagine probably what they see from so high up, OK? So we're gonna saw. Great. One, two, one, two. Great. And then let's not forget we're celebrating birds. So we're gonna celebrate. Okay? So celebrate and saw. All right. Let's just have some fun. Just enjoy it.
job. I'm sure your arms. I'm sure your arms are quite tired because mine are. All right. So let's go. We're going on to the other song. You're hanging there. It's quite. All right, so the next song, it's inspired by the wood thrush, how they like to jump in the leaf litter. So we're gonna try to jump like a bird, okay? So, oh, before I show you the jump, let me show you one other cue. So, so we go one, two, one, two, then step back like this, back, Three, four. One more time. One, two, arms stretched out, two, and then one back, leg back, three, four. Okay? Right. So now for the jump, we're gonna go step one, step other leg two, and then jump back, two. One, two, okay? One more time, step, step forward, then jump back. And this time we're gonna, arms up while we jump back. Okay, so all together it'll be step forward, step forward, back, back, all right? You all got this, let's go. got this hope you're having fun so far okay we're winding down now we're winding down all right all right so some cues for this one so right so at the beginning of the class we stretched we warmed up brought up our heart rate warmed up our muscles we worked really hard flying like birds and soaring like birds, jumping like birds. So now we're gonna start bringing it down a little bit to get your heart rate close to normal, or back to normal, and to get your muscles to cool down a little bit, okay? So this one, we're gonna do some basic 
Salsa Steps. And it's inspired by green wing teals. They like to do a little shake. So we're gonna try to shake too, okay? Right, so we're gonna shake. You might bring it forward and do some shaking. Okay, right, and then so a little more complicated, but I'm sure you all can do it, right? Step, skip, step. If you can't get it, skip, you can just step, pause, step, pause. Perfectly fine, okay? And to make it a little more interesting, let me step, right? Then we take it up a notch, Tommy. turn, okay? Turn, okay? I'm sure you all get, got it. And don't forget to shimmy, don't forget to smile. Have some fun. Learning lots about birds through dance. Great. Fijita Music. Donuts on the feed. So great. So I'm sure you're probably feeling really warmed up, ready for the next session, okay? 
All right, so, you know, take a sip, hydrate yourself. If you need a towel, use a towel. It's all right, okay? So if you want, take five seconds, grab a sip, take a wipe, and we'll continue. Okay, I really need the wipe. It's very humid here. So I really hope you'll enjoy this session. We just need to stretch now because we worked so hard, like how those birds work when they're migrating, okay? So let's um, control our breathing, inhale slowly, exhale slowly, and just stretch those muscles a little further than you think you can go, okay? All right, so let's enjoy a really nice stretch. Nice. Just 
just shake it out. Take a nice deep breath in. Exhale. Great job. All right. Okay, I hope you all enjoyed today's session. Oh, right, I hope you all enjoyed today's session, dancing like a bird. And I hope you learned something as well from this session. And that's it. So, We'll pass it on to the next speaker. Yes, Miguel, are you coming on? Yeah, I'm here. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. That was fantastic. We love Like a Bird with you. Oh, thank you. I, I really hope you all had some fun and probably tried to shake a leg or something. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. We we <laughs> needed that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to I'm going to take off and let you lead this session, Miguel. Thank you. Now for the next session, we have a special guest from the Korean also from Trinidad and Tobago. And she, she is Alia Hoysen is here. Can you turn your camera and microphone on, please? Hello. Welcome, Alia. Um, it's very nice having you here, um, especially because Alia is an educator from the Caribbean, and she has she have amazing history to share with us today. Um, she loves Paros. Um, yeah, Alia, tell me. Tell us a little more about your experience and what you're going to do with us today. Okay. All right. Thank you, Miguel. Okay. So I, as Miguel said, I am a wildlife biologist from Trinidad and Tobago. And yes, I, I do love parrots, but for now I'm not working only with um, parrots. I am a member of the media working group and currently the assistant CEBF coordinator for Birds Caribbean. So I get to work with all the, all the birds from the Caribbean region right now. And for today's session, I will be sharing um, some of the books that I have created, um, well, helped to create, um, to teach uh, people from the Caribbean about their own Caribbean birds. Thank you, Alia. You are free to share your screen and welcome again. Okay. Um, we are happy to have you here. All right. Let me share screen. Oh, let's see this one right here. Okay. Um, are you seeing my screen? Not yet. Not yet. yet. Okay. I'm clicking to allow, but. I'm not sure why it yeah. isn't. Do you have permission to share your screen? Yes, I have. Uh, um, okay, that's no. Okay. I have to um, reop um, rejoin the meeting and okay. then it will. Um, Leah, would it be simpler to send the pre presentation to one of us? Okay, I could share it. Yeah. Okay, why don't you do that? And then you won't have to go out and come back in. And then in okay. the meantime, we can just talk to you. Love to hear more okay. about what you're working on. Yeah. Meanwhile, Alia sent us her presentation. Um, Alia, I know you are very interested in traffic and wildlife, especially in the Caribbean region. 
Can yes. you talk us a little bit more about that uh, after you send the presentation? Um, uh, people will love uh, how you start in this field and to know how you start in this field and why you are so passionate about this, this team. How I um, started? It was true. Um, well, it all started with my undergraduate project on pirates. And well, what I had to do was write an, um, a species profile of the scarlet macaw. But while learning about the scarlet macaw, I was learning about other pirates. And what I realized was that um, they were every time every each parrot that I I read about, each one was threatened by the pet parrot trade. And remember, this was um, back in 2011. And the books that I was reading, I was reading was probably published years before that. So it it to me, it was a problem that just wasn't going to go away anytime soon. And I realized that it was also a huge problem in Trinidad and Tobago because we do like keeping um, parrots as pets. And um, so you, I'm just checking to see you got the presentation, right? Yeah. I have okay. the presentation and now Susan and Melina will help us later with that. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so I, um, yeah, so I just, I continued um, learning about parrots and then my other, um, when I started my master's degree as well, I knew I wanted to continue studying parrots. And it was only until um, my postgraduate experience, um, sorry, um, work was that I started working on the illegal pirate trade in Trinidad. And it, it was very fascinating to me because what we studied was the consumer side of the trade, so the demand side, and really trying to understand why people were so drawn to these pirates and why they kept um, getting more and more. Okay. And what is the most, in, uh, uh, we have here the presentations. Now, uh, Susan can help us with show the slide and now you are free to go. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that background though, Alia. That was um, it's so interesting and it's always wonderful to learn how people get into their career and what got them motivated to do what they do today. And we really appreciate your great work. Okay. You can just let me know by saying next slide and I'll move it forward. Okay. Well, this is, um, so this is just the title slide. So um, I'll be talking about um, three books that I helped to create. So one is the Junior Bird Watcher. Um, this is specifically for Trinidad and Tobago. Um, then the, a collection of cultural myths, tales, and beliefs about um, Caribbean birds, which the Media Working Group of Birds Caribbean has been working on. And um, the St. Lucia Parrots Rainforest Survival Guide is actually, and I will explain what that is later on in the presentation. So you can, you can go to the next slide. All right, so a little bit about Birds Caribbean. It is a nonprofit dedicated to the uh, conservation of Caribbean birds and the protection of their habitats. Uh, birds Caribbean works in the insular Caribbean. So by this, I mean the Bahamas, the Greater Antilles and the Lesser Antilles. And they have been working here for um, about 32 years, so uh, a long time. And it is made up of a diverse community of international and regional members, all working to um, all working together towards 
that common conservation goal of ensuring that future generations would be able to enjoy the region's um, endemic and native bird species. So, true, so throughout the year, Birds Caribbean hosts uh, different programs. So right now is the uh, Caribbean Endemic Bird Festival. And this year's theme is also a sing, fly, soar like a bird. And how it is organized is that each day an endemic species is featured along with um, information on its range, its um, physical description, feeding behavior, breeding behavior, as well as um, videos, its uh, calls or bird songs, puzzles and other activities. We also have a weekly webinar series. So each, um, every Thursday at 4 p.m. Uh, and because the theme this year is Sing, Fly, Soar Like a Bird, the webinars will be tied directly to bird songs and flight. So other programs include um, World Migratory Bird Day. So we would um, celebrate that in the fall, the Caribbean Water Bird Census, the Caribbean Bird and Trail and a mentorship um, program. The um, organization also has numerous working groups. So again, I am a member of the media working group and the goal of this media working group is to raise the profile of Birds Caribbean through um, social media, so Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and so on, as well as traditional media, so um, radio, TV, newspapers, and also to help um, other members to um, to improve their media relations so that they too can share um, conservation messages with their audiences. And of course, there are other working groups like the Seabird um, Monitoring Working Group and the Endemic and Threatened um, Species Working Group, the Pirates Working Group, and so on. Okay, next slide, please. All right. So for today's presentation, I'll be um, talking a little bit about bird diversity in the Caribbean, um, how we can create the next generation of bird nerds or just people who really appreciate birds. And I'll share some examples of Caribbean uh, bird books. Okay, next slide. All right. Um, but if, to begin, I have a quiz. Uh, can you all name these birds? And if um if you want, you could just type it into the chat, and maybe Miguel can read the responses. And uh, now we don't have any responses yet, but okay, a little bit. Okay. You may want to keep going, and if we get some responses, we'll share them with you. It takes a little while for us to check all the Facebook pages. Okay. We're live streaming to about oh, five. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Okay. Okay. That's okay. All right. So these are some very popular um, birds, right? Um, so I'll let you know. Okay. So the first one is a penguin. Or we, we would know this. And uh, the other one is a, a toucan. So yes, we may know um, the toucan from um, the, on, the, on the cover of a cereal box. And also that is from, when you see the toucan, you think of Central and South America. And you actually uh, did get three, an answer from, um, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce the name, but it's Noor Adin Mohammed who says, <laughs> bird nerds, you are emperor penguin, tropical toucan and ostrich. Yes, right. So that's correct. So he he knows these birds. Okay. So then, um, to the next slide now. Okay. Right. So what about these birds? Do you think you know these birds? What are these birds? Okay. 
And again, I think if you want to continue on, we'll wait and come back to you with the answers. Okay. So on the left is the immature bee hummingbird. And this is endemic to Cuba and the smallest bird species. So you all might have known that because it is um, pretty phenomenal. And on the right, it's a yellow bill parrot, an endemic parrot species um, to the island of Jamaica. Okay, so uh, our next slide. Okay, so what I was getting at is that we know about um, birds from Africa or North America, South America, but we also have um, amazing birds in the Caribbean region as well. And we have a lot, um, 171 endemic birds, which means 171 birds um, can only be found in this region. Next slide, please. Okay. So how do we um, create a new generation of bird lovers, especially from people, um, especially with people, sorry, who are not bird watchers or even associate um, themselves with bird watchers? So this is what I learned while I was helping to create these um, bird books. You have to make it enjoyable. And that is you have to make it fun. No one really wants to participate in an activity that is um, overwhelming or something that is boring or they don't really understand. Uh, make it accessible so that um, Anyone, regardless of age, gender, class, um, I mean, socioeconomic class or education level um, could participate, uh, make it unique. So, for example, remind them that um, for us here in the region, these birds can only be found here within the Caribbean region and then um, make it personal. And by this, I mean remind them that uh, through their own actions, they can contribute to the conservation of um, birds and even um, share that knowledge and enjoyable feeling that they get from uh, bird watching. So uh, next slide, please. Right. Okay, so the first, um, book I'll talk about is a junior bird watcher and it's exactly what is written on the cover. It is a super short um, book on the basics of birding in Trinidad and Tobago and this was created by two local NGOs, um, the Trinidad and Tobago Field Naturalist Club and the Center for the Rescue of Endangered Species of Trinidad and Tobago. We created this book with um, nine to 12 year olds in mind, but really anyone who wants to learn about, who doesn't know about birds and wants to learn about birds can, can read the book and, and learn and enjoy the activities. And what, we, what our intention was, was to get them to um, first understand understand the, um, what are birds and hopefully make them a bit curious about their natural world. So this book contains really simple information um, so about what is a bird. So from the very um, be beginner level, what is a bird? Um, how do birds eat? What do birds like to eat? We also included um, what, how do birds sing and why is it important for birds to sing? And we try to include some new terms as well for them to, um, to learn. So like territory and predator. And um, again, the um, layout, we try to make it very fun and um, colorful and attention grabbing. Uh, next slide, please. All right, and 
we did um, ask them to go outside and look at birds. But what we did is that we provided them with some um, information first and how to how does someone go out and bird watch like what kind of clothes they should wear um they sh should be mindful of um how much noise they make where could where can they find birds like where to look um and so on and then we what we did is that we turned it into an expedition so instead of telling them okay go out go outside and look at these birds um we turned it into an expedition and we gave the we told them what they needed um we provided them with the record sheets and the record sheets as well had photos of the birds and um we also shared bird calls with them so that even if they did not see the bird they um and they heard a bird, they would be able to, you know, match the sounds back to the photos. And um, and we gave them some instructions again, like um, where to look and how to, um, to remember to be um, quiet and to be respectful of other people's properties. We did not really um, want to complicate things by, you know, telling them they needed binoculars and field guides and whatnot but just to get them outside and looking at the birds that they could find in their own um yards backyards okay next slide okay and of course we um we had to include the birds of trinidad and tobago so for people who don't know we have the scarlet ibis which is the national bird of trinidad and then the kokriko the national bird of um tobago we also have two endemic species so one um you all may know the pipe and guan or the pawi i think this is um the more popular one and then we also have a trinidad mot mot so again, we're making it um, personal and unique to them. Okay, next slide. Yes. All right. And um, we added in this pledge just again to remind them that through simple everyday actions, they could help birds. And so this would include talking to their friends and families about birds and why they are important to not interfere with um, birds or their nest or their eggs, to keep cats inside, um, to not litter, and even, um, you know, to supply these birds with food so that the birds will keep coming back to their backyard. And um, so we we use the pledge instead of saying, um, asking them to donate to an organization or write to their um, government agencies or to go and plant a tree. And all of those are really good um, suggestions too, but it might be um, overwhelming to that age group and also to even um, adults or so people who are to new to bird watching and the world of um, birding. So this is just a reminder or an encouragement that um, they too can um, help to protect birds by just um, following these simple steps. Well, not steps, but taking these simple actions. Okay, next slide. All right. So next up, we have the um, Endemic Birds of the West Indies Coloring Book. And this was uh, created by Birds Caribbean. So this coloring book has, I believe, 50 species of endemic birds. And it's not just a, um, a plain coloring book with, you know, drawings, illustrations of the birds, and then you go in and you color it however you want. Um, it's organized so that Yes, you do have the illustrations of the birds, but they also provide um, some guidance on how to color the birds so that it is um, represented as it would be in real life. And in addition to that, some facts about the birds as well, like where is it um, found, 
what physical its physical description and um perhaps some what it eats or where it um where it breathes as well and the illustrator uh, uh for this book was christine elder um if any one of you all has joined our learn to sketch webinars um it's the same person she is an artist and a science educator so she has been working with birds caribbean for some time and mark yokoyama as well worked on this coloring book he is also a member of the um media working group so this book is available for download on the birds caribbean website so birdscaribbean.org or you can um, order hard copies as well from the website okay. next slide please all right okay so the most recent uh book that the media working group has been working on is um, this book a collection of cultural myths tales and beliefs about caribbean birds so what we did is that we asked members of birds caribbean to submit stories poems artwork um, photographs about birds and um, for the stories in particular we were looking for um, conservation projects or even personal stories um, that they had with birds. We also accepted uh, folklores, um, tales, songs, uh, any um, expressions that included birds, um, uh, games, food or drink, anything that was related to birds. And what we did is we took all of this and we compiled it into an ebook. And so now this would be available um, on the website again. We have we would have a PDF version and one that you can flip through um, on the site itself. And the one that you can flip through, it's a little bit interactive because we were able to add uh, songs and videos to that one. Um, so that was pretty exciting as well um, to make it a bit more um, lively. But this was um, very interesting to us. Well, after we collected these stories and we organized everything, because we were able to um, include accounts from since the beginning of recorded history of when the um, Amerindians were settled on these islands and um, what were their beliefs about the birds and how they viewed birds um, to, ev to even slaves, how birds were symbols of um, freedom to them and straight into independence when um, the islands were, you know, um, breaking away from the colonial rule. Uh, for example, we see the St. Vincent parrot uh, in this um on this slide here and this parrot as well as the other um endemic parrots in the lesser antilles were very um prominent during that um you know historical event for the islands as they were as they were becoming independent they associated very strongly with the um the, their islands endemic parrots and again we were also able to collect some um, poems and really wonderful artwork from our members um, we will be sharing this book sometime next week so um, be sure to you know check out um, our facebook and website we will um, post the links there as well okay. next slide please all right and lastly, we are trying to build a virtual Caribbean bird scene library. Um, this collection would be of all the endemic birds in the Caribbean. And yes, it is a, a mammoth task, but what we're doing is um, we're offering a bird zine contest so that um, 
we could encourage people to participate and submit entries. Um, and what is a zine? So a zine is just a self-published hand-binded booklet. And what goes into the zine is your thoughts, your artwork, your photographs, your understanding really of um, what a topic is. So for, for us, we provided the prompts. And again, it is tied back to the team. Thing flies so like a bird. So we have different topics like why, um, how do birds sing? Um, why do birds fly, for example? And there are some, some more that people can choose from. So you don't necessarily have to, um, if you don't know, if, you, if you're not interested really in song or flight, there are other options for you as well. And we will accept um, entries from children and adults in Spanish, English, and French. And the deadline for this is Sunday, 30th of May. So you still have some time. And we have um, two binoculars each worth over 200 US dollars as a grand prize. So please, please, um, you know, go to the website and look at the guidelines. And we also created a document um, on what is a zine and how to make your own zine if you're still not too sure. Um, so yes, yeah, so we are looking to, forward to receiving your entries. The more entries we get, the more complete our collection would be. Um, next slide, please. All right, so I created um, a zine as well to just to provide an example. And um, so this, so my one is called the St. Lucia Paris Rainforest Survival Guide. And really what this is, is um, this zine tells you how the St. Lucia Parrot is adapted to live in, in the rainforest. And um, so I, um, so you see, I started off with uh, just to explain where the parrot could be found and um, what type of habitat it lives in. And uh, another example, for, well, another page from this zine is um, one way in that they survive is that they um, live in flocks. But, but that's the, um, the fun part about making zines is that you get to explain what you have uh, or share what you have learned in your own unique way. So instead of me just saying back, okay, parrots, um, parrots live in flocks and this helps them to escape predators. Um, I was able to like make uh, that little hawk alert symbol and that um, theme acronym. So it's really up to you to decide how um, how you want your zine to look. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very, very much. I, I, I was very excited to be able to share um, all these different books. <laughs> And again, they are um, free to download, right? So TTFNC, it's free to download. Um, and the Birds and Culture book would be free to download as well. So, and I hope that everyone um, learns something from it or is amazed by it, or, or it, it gets them thinking about how deeply connected we are to birds. Thank you very much, Alia. I, I know you are very creative and enthusiastic leader in the Caribbean, and I hope you get different history to share with us later when you get the winners. But uh, mm -hmm. I know yes. you have a, a great potential in, in with that uh, contents. And mm -hmm. thank you so much for, for sharing how to make one of the scenes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, people are asking, Mm -hmm. You are from the Cali Caribbean and you celebrate Cari Endemic Caribbean Bird Festival, right? But mm -hmm. what is your endemic favorite bird? Uh, <laughs> I have to choose a favorite. Uh... <laughs> hmm. I 
You see, I, I like... <laughs> uh, that means I would have to choose a parrot. <laughs> but I would have to say the St. Vincent. I know that. <laughs> parrot, yes. It, it's huge and it's... it's um, so there are two morphs. There's a brown morph and a green morph. So I'm used to seeing green parrots. But when I saw the brown morph, I was like, whoa, it's, like, it's very colorful. And <laughs> yes. And it's only found on the island of St. Vincent. So that makes it even better. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, another question here is, we know that uh, birds in the Caribbean experiment, experiment different difficulties in, the, in their environment, like hurricanes and loss of habitat. Mm -hmm. How people in, in the Caribbean are working to protect their beer, the endemic birds and also and they give in different habitat for migratory birds as well. Uh, yeah, can you share some of the special thing you are doing for protect birds in, in the Caribbean island? Um. For me, I'm not on any particular bird conservation project. But um, recently, uh, well, after the hurry, um, sorry, not hurricane, the volcano erupted, we started a GoFundMe um, campaign. And that was, um, that was to raise funds to help the St. Vincent Forestry Department um, rescue and rehabilitate as needed um, the St. Vincent Amazon. So, um, so that has been, we have received a lot of support for that. Uh, so thank you if any donors uh, and other supporters are watching. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, yes, they have been, because the forestry officers, they have been um, working since they got declared to go out into the field. They started clearing trails and looking for these birds. And they are also, um, you know, uh, putting things in place for if, when and, well, when they find birds that need to be taken out of the wild and cared for, um, before it can be released again yeah okay thank you so much alia for your time here and, and we love uh, all the information you shared with us so now it's time to have a new, a new session for the kahoot and uh, it's our contest for prizes so if you want to stay on and try okay. to answer all these questions um, i'm gonna pass the the kahoot uh, session to susan okay Yes. So I want to announce the winners from the previous one. Our first place winners were Julia and Libby. Our second place winner was Miss Qual's class, and that's 31 students. And the third place winner was Steph. So when you play Kahoot, it uh, takes your answers by speed and accuracy. So it's not just accuracy. We invite you to join the next Kahoot. So all you have to do is on your computer or on your phone, go to kahoot.it. And here's the number for you. It's on the screen if you're watching. It's 0026929981. And we're going to leave it open until the end of the day. And so we'll announce winners at the end of the day. So go for it. It's a uh, It's a fun one on migration. So see how well you can do with that Kahoot. Thanks so much. And then again, we'll announce the winners at the end of the day and you can email us if you're the winner and we'll send you a prize. We have some great prizes for you from our wonderful collection of Environment for the Americas bird materials. So look forward to seeing your answers on this one. All right, Miguel. Excellent. I want, I want to be the, one of the, the winners of the Kahoot, but I know all the answers. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you don't get to play it, unfortunately. <laughs> so actually, so we have a little bit of time before we bring on Fiona. Is that right? Yeah, I, I don't know, Susan, if you want to share. Uh, everybody is uh, asking about your favorite beer, but what is your favorite beer, Susan? Oh, I feel like Jordan, there are 10,000 <laughs> species and I have a hard time with that question. But since I get asked it so much, I picked two to use as my favorite birds. And um, so I have those actually ready to go. Uh, 
So I'm going to get two, not just one. So one of my favorite bird species is the Wilson's warbler, Wilsonia. Oh, did they change the genus? It was Pusilla. Um, and why I like it so much is because it's one of the species that I've done the most research on in terms of banding. So I've banded, bird banded, you know, you put a little band on a bird and then we track them. I've banded a lot of Wilson's warblers. So uh, that always kind of creates a connection to that species. The other species I really like is the American Dipper. And I like them because um, I love the mountains and they are a bird of streams, uh, not always in the mountains, but where I'm from in Colorado, they, they tend to be in mountain streams. And so here's this little gray, you know, it's not flashy bird and it spends its time actually swimming underwater kind of, uh, looking for food on the bottom of these shallow uh, streams and creeks. And so you'll, you'll see dippers and they also have this funny behavior. You can only see me from the shoulders up, but they bob. So they bob on a rock and then they go into the water and they, they search for their food under rocks. So I love the American dipper too. And then all those other birds out there. Cool. I hope when you uh, travel down to the South America, uh, we have an, another dipper in South America in the Andes. And mm -hmm. it's very similar to the, your species, but it's another one for you. Yeah. And that's the other reason why I like the American dipper and the Wilson's warbler. Wilson's warbler is also a long distance migrant. And so you can find it when I travel and get to travel and parts of Latin America, I see it. And so it's so fun to say, oh my gosh, I'm seeing it, you know, on its wintering sites and non-breeding sites. And then I'll get to see it at home again. And American dipper, yes, there are dippers uh, species in other parts of the Americas too. So I have never seen one outside of the United States though. I would love to do that. So what, what do you want to do right now? Maybe well, we actually, can do an overview about the day and maybe what we Sure, mm -hmm. we could give an overview about tomorrow and then Fiona has actually come on a little bit early. So she's welcome to start a little early, but why don't we give the schedule for tomorrow? Do you want to do that or you want yeah. me to do that? For tomorrow, um, yeah, I, I can do the morning, you do the afternoon. Okay. During the morning, uh, Tomorrow is the official World Migratory Bird Day, second Saturday of May. Uh, we have different activities during the morning to close the Bird Day Life event. Thank you so much, people, to, to be here in the second day. It's just one day more, and it will be the most fun of, of everybody. Um, now, during the morning, we're going to have some beer washing treat from Central America with all coordinators in Panama, Salvador, and Ecuador. Then we're going to have a short presentation of the World Beer uh, Quorum. Is, is, is this session leading, uh, was led by the East Asian of Australasian Flyway. They put together people around the world, and, and they do this the World Migratory Beer Day song. So don't miss that because it will be very special. After that, we're gonna have um, another young forum with Ike, a uh, John Burden. Then Adam is a is the creator of a digital game named uh, Find the Birds. You can also do download this uh, video game in your platform, in your cell phone, in Google Play. Um, then we're gonna play some music for Philip the Hulk. Uh, they compose a, a, a song for Halt. And then we, we're gonna sh share a different stop oversight across the Pacific Flyway. Um, we, will, we will connect with different enrichers across different countries. So don't miss that very much because, uh, because it, it will be a very cool experience travel around the world. Um, we're gonna share some other EFTA programs and and we conclude uh, at the noon with Beer Cities America and, and, and now the activity for the afternoon. Susan, what do you have for that? Yes. So after we, uh, if you're not familiar with Bird Cities, this is an amazing program that engages communities and making their cities more bird friendly. So we have the first uh, Bird City Colorado that we'll be highlighting tomorrow. We're excited to do that. 
Um, so that will be quite a bit of fun. And then we have a poetry competition that was coordinated by Amigos Alados. This is what's called a twinning project. This project connects young people in California with young people in Mexico in uh, the state of Jalisco. And so they just completed their poetry uh, submissions and we're gonna hear from some of the winning uh, poems. Um, then we're gonna go to the Atlantic Flyway and track the migration of shorebirds on the Atlantic Flyway. So we're excited to go from uh, Tierra de, de Fuego all the way to Delaware Bay, meeting with biologists and researchers and educators uh, all up the flyway. So that's gonna be, uh, that's a fantastic opportunity to follow these migrations. Um, we're gonna conclude the day with our artist, our 2021 artist, Sarah Woolman, as well as an amazing musician, Tamara Montenegro. And Tamara does, uh, incorporates bird song into her music. And Sarah, of course, created the beautiful piece for World Migratory Bird Day this year. So uh, we'll have the opportunity to see them and how they do their art and learn more about that before we close for the weekend. We've also had some questions, Miguel, about, we just had a phone call here actually about what if I'm out birding? What do I do with my sightings? And so this is a great opportunity for you to participate in a couple of opportunities. First, if you get up early and you wanna hear the dawn chorus, that's the first songs of the morning and you want to record those, you can actually send in your, uh, send in your recordings to dawn chorus and that is online. We can get you that information if you're interested. And you can also submit your, uh, your, your recording, your sightings to Global Big Day. Uh, they'll be taking your observations throughout the day. And if you're not familiar with how to do that, you'll wanna go to what's called eBird. That's exactly how it sounds, E with bird. And uh, you'll learn how to put your submissions into the database there. So we hope that you all get out and see birds. If you're not out, come visit us and see some of our programs online, but whatever you do, we hope you have a really great day. Thank you, Susan, and thank you so much for, for sharing that good news. And we have a, a surprises for the presentations of Sarah Wolman. She's gonna share some new arts. Um, also, thank you very much for everybody uh, watching us. Um, we are really appreciate, appreciate your contribution. So, let, 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 let you know, let us know if you can contribute to our educational program. And thank you for all the sponsors. Now I, yeah, I think actually, we can maybe, start with Fiona. Actually, can I, can I hold off for just a minute, Miguel? Because you, you, just, um, you just reminded me that I do want to thank our sponsors again. So sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Uh, because I do want to make sure we do this thank you again. And mm -hmm. for those of you who don't know, uh, World Migratory Bird Day is coordinated by Environment for the Americas. We focus on the Americas, uh, but we work closely with our partners at the Convention on Migratory Species. That's a United Nations program and the African Eurasian Water Bird Agreement. Uh, they coordinate flyways outside of the Americas. And so that partnership is extremely important to the success of World Migratory Bird Day. I also want to thank our many sponsors who help make the programs possible. That includes not only this, these days of programming, but also the great work that our coordinators do across the Americas, and you've met them, Miguel uh, Mata in Venezuela, Leticia in um, El Salvador, Lara um, from Trinidad, and Daniela from Mexico. So the you know, it takes a lot to put together programs and all the education materials that we provide. So thank you. Thank you to all these wonderful sponsors, to our partners. We also uh, definitely depend on donations. So if you want to contribute to our work and our education programs and our work in communities across the Americas, we certainly appreciate that also. So we invite you to join us as a viewer, as a participant, and also as a contributor. And now, thank you for that. Um, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Miguel. Thanks so much for the time. Okay. Now we're going to um, invite to Fiona. Fiona, you here. You are welcome to share your video and your microphone, please. Hello. Hello, Fiona. Thank you so much to 
be here with you, with us. Um, sorry, I speak Spanish and I am learning so much in English. So, um, it's okay. It's okay. yeah, Fiona is a young Berlin and so talented, and we are so uh, pleasure to be here. So, Fiona, can you tell us a little bit why is your background in the beer world and why you chose beer to to educate? Yeah. Um, I have, can I, can I share my screen? Yeah, you're free okay. to share it. Awesome. I will do that. All right. Um, so hello, uh, my name is Fiona um, and I have been a serious birder um, for quite some time since I was 11. I'm 17 now. So I got into birds, um, I started with chickens. Um, I got chickens when I was six years old um, and I loved them and I pet them um, and I named them. So that's kind of how I got into birds was through domestic birds. Um, so after I got chickens, I sort of expanded um, to other birds um, with a field guide that belonged to my dad. And so I went on my first bird walk um, when I was 11 years old. Um, that was at Trailer Ranch, um, which is a place near where I live. Um, and so that was really, really fun. I got to go um, on, on my first um, bird walk, like officially with binoculars and everything. I was so excited. And after that trip, um, I got a bird box um, near my house um, that, I, I, that I got to install there. Um, and there was a nest of oak tit mice in it the next year, which was really, really fun. Um, so that was, that, that, that was a great little bird moment. Um, I got to watch um, and monitor the nest box. Um, while there were oak tip mice building in it, which was really, really cool. Um, so one of my favorite ways um, to learn about birds is to draw them. Um, so when I was 14 years old, um, I met uh, one of my most amazing mentors, um, whose name is John Muir Laws, um, and he worked with me um, on my eighth grade project. Um, so basically at the school that I go to, um, it is required that every eighth grade student do a project um, at the end of the year. And so I decided I was going to draw the 40 most common birds in my area. Um, so this is a cedar waxwing um, that I drew, the photograph that I drew it from, and then my drawing. Um, and so Jack, uh, my mentor, asked me to draw a robin at the beginning and a robin at the end of the project. And I was completely a different person. Um, you can see how much I improved even in just 16 weeks. Um, so that was really amazing. And I just really want to emphasize again, um, the more you draw, the better you will get. Um, I did not just magically have talent for drawing. I've been drawing for a very long time. Um, and so the more you draw, the better you will get. Um, it is not a gift. Um, it is something that you can learn and something that you can get better at. Um, so something else um, that I love about birds is what's called nature journaling. So it's basically combining two things that I love, which is art and nature. Um, so I've been journaling since my 13th birthday. Um, so it's almost been five years. Um, and I've completed almost 2,000 uh, nature journal pages. Um, so basically, it's, it's sort of like field sketching. It's taking your art kit out into nature and using words, pictures, and numbers to describe what you notice, what you wonder, and what things remind you of. Um, so it's really, really fun. Um, and one of my favorite parts of birding has become drawing the birds that I see in the field. And um, so here's just an example of one of my pages. Um, this was a great horned owl that I saw um, near the coast of California where I live. Um, and then this is an American pipit um, that was also near the coast of California that was really, really cute. Um, another owl and a Northern Harrier. Um, so that's kind of how my pages look. I have writing all over, um, a lot of drawings, uh, maps sometimes and diagrams and things like that. So when, or not, Not, not that yet. Um, so it makes burning so much more fun. So when I journal, I notice more. And the more I notice, the more fun it gets, um, which is really, really fun. Um, so the more I journal and draw the birds that I see, the more I learn about them. And that's really, really fun. Um, so since today um, is World Migratory Bird Day, I picked a bird that has a very long migration um, for us to draw today. Um, so this is the Arctic Tern. So Every year, the Arctic terns migrate from the Arctic Circle to the Antarctic Circle, and the round trip um, is about 30,000 kilometers or 18,000 miles. Um, so that is a lot of miles um, for this little turn to fly. Um, so I'm going to switch to my, I'm going to stop sharing um, and switch to my document camera here. So turn off that. 
All right, I'm gonna move my keyboard out of the way. All right, so can, can, can you spot like this, Miguel, by any chance? Yeah, I, I see uh, uh, all, but I can see that your other video. <clears throat> Maybe Melinda can help. Yeah, there. You. there we go. There okay, go. cool. Thank you. Um, so this is the bird um, that we're going to be drawing from. Um, so normally how I would start um, is I would start with this very pale blue pencil. Um, it's called a non-photo blue pencil. Um, but since it is so pale, um, it's really hard to see on the document camera. So I'm actually going to do a little bit of a darker pencil today. Um, so this is not the pencil I typically use. But just to help everybody see, um, I'm going to use this pencil today. Um, so kind of for this bird, I'm just going to sort of start um, with the general oval for about where I'm going to put the body of the bird. And this bird has a very nice long tail. Um, so I'm going to sort of block in about where that's going to be. The tail and the edge of its wings like that. Um, and I'm going to come up and sort of draw the head up here, looking to the side. Sort of a slight down curve to the beak. So that's kind of how I'm going to start, um, is just kind of blocking out where, where things are and sort of deciding, deciding generally where things are going to be. So with this pencil, it's, it's very light. Um, so I can, I can move lines. I don't have to get committed to anything yet. Um, so if you have a line that's not quite in the right place, that's okay. Um, you can change it. Um, so once I've kind of got a, a sort of outline of what I kind of want to do, um, then I'm going to come in with a graphite pencil and sort of go over the lines that I want to keep. So this bird's got a nice little angle on the top of its head, sort of this line coming down. And they have beautiful red feet, these birds. I think I got a little too excited about how the bill is slightly down curved um, and I made it a little too down curved. So I'm gonna fix that um, and make it a little bit straighter. I don't have quite enough room for my tail. I didn't block that out very well. Oh, well. I'm just going to kind of put in some feather edges. So just kind of the general gist of the bird. I'm actually going to bring in the side of the neck a little bit because that's a little bit too far out. So don't, don't be concerned about putting lines in the wrong place. You can always change them. That's totally OK. I'm just going to fix a few little angles here. All right, so now I'm going to kind of come in and do a little bit more detail. So here's kind of the line of where that the black cap stops. And if you sort of draw a line up from the beak, the eye is going to kind of be on that line. So there's going to be my eye. This is all going to be shaded darker. Still not quite happy with the shape of this beak.
All right, so once I kind of have a shape that I like, um, actually, I'm, I'm gonna change the forehead angle. I just cannot get the beak right. All right, so once I kind of have a shape that I like, um, I'm going to put in some color. Um, so this is the palette I'm gonna use. Um, I don't have enough room on my screen to have it there um, the whole time, so it's gonna be off to the side, um, but this is the palette that I use um, for all of my color. Um, so I'm gonna start with sort of the shadows um, and sort of go from more general to specific. just kind of the gray. Fiona, can you tell what is that kind of tool you, you, you are using now, this pencil? Oh, this? Yeah, it's a water brush. Um, so basically, there's water in the handle of it, and you can refill it. Um, so it's, it's really, it's really handy. I don't have to carry water in the field. Um, so you just squeeze it a little bit and the, and, and the water comes out on the end of it. Um, so it's, it's a very useful tool. Um, so I don't have to carry water in the field, um, which is really helpful. It's amazing. So generally with watercolor, you wanna move from the lightest to the darkest. Um, so I'm not gonna initially come in with the darkest shadows here. I'm just gonna kind of give it that light gray wash um, for the specific bird. And then eventually move the shadows down to how, to how dark it is on the, on the belly of this bird. These birds actually hold their wings kind of down, um, if you see here. So normally the wing of, of the birds, their, their wrist kind of would be like right here. Um, but in this case, it's right here, which is kind of interesting. They hold their wings a lot lower. That's, that's true of most terns. And then when they sit down, they kind of have this hunchy little posture with their wings really far down. Once I've kind of got the shadows kind of where I want them, um, I'm gonna next come in with some of the red for the beak and the feet. That sort of orangey red color.
I'm going to actually add a little more definition to the wing here. That leading edge is pretty dark. All right, so now while I still have some of that red color mixed, I'm going to move on to the beak. Well, it's still a little bit wet. Might let it dry a little more. Yeah, I'm actually gonna let it dry a little more before I do that. This paper doesn't absorb water as quickly. So it's, the paint is still a little bit wet. All right, so now I'm gonna move back to the beak. Sort of painted that orangey red color. Actually, I'm going to paint over the eye for now because it's pretty hard to see um, on the original photo as well. Um, so I'm going to paint over the eye for now and I'm going to come back and give it a highlight once this paint dries. Just going to take a little bit, but. All right, I'm going to give this bird a little thing to sit on. Fiona, you have a question from one of our viewers. They're asking, where did you get your photo? Um, I got it from a website called birdpixel.com. Um, the photographer is a friend of mine. Right. And, and can you speak to using photos to create art? Yeah. Um, so I have used a lot of photos um, to create art before, 
Um, however, a lot of what I do is in the field. Um, so often I'll be working from a live bird. Um, obviously I wouldn't have as much time as I would with a bird that doesn't fly away. Um, however, I've, I've, I've sort of got some techniques um, for drawing very, very quickly um, when the bird is, is moving all the time. Um, so it, definitely for practice, um, I would suggest um, drawing from photographs just to kind of get, get, get good at getting the idea of the bird really fast and getting the gesture of it. Um, before moving to the field. Um, but in the field, it is really fun um, to draw from live birds as well. Um, but I would say for practice um, to to work with birds that, that will not fly away. So you can kind of get the gist of them before they, before they leave. Yeah, I can imagine that's helpful. Are there any copyright issues? Let's say you drew a bird from a photograph and then you sold it. Is there any, are there any regulations associated with that? Um, that not know? that I know of. Um, it, 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 it's very good to credit the photographer, um, to say, oh, this was drawn from this photograph. Um, so that's, that's, that's always a good thing to do. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly the, 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 the regulations around that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So now that this black paint on the crown is dry, um, I'm gonna come back with one of my favorite tools um, that's called a gel pen. Um, so it's basically, an op it, it has opaque white ink. Um, and so it's really, really useful um, for highlights and stuff like that. So I'm actually gonna get it started. Sometimes it's a little temperamental and doesn't wanna start. Okay, um, so basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just put a little dot um, on the highlight of the eye and so you, you can see that there's a little dot there as well. So that really brings the bird's eye to life, um, which is really, really cool. Um, and so it, it's a technique that I use a lot. Um, and once that eye is looking back at you, um, that really helps the whole drawing. Add a little more dimension to the beak. I'm going to put a little bit of a shadow on the underside of it. A little more detail to the wings. Oh, my, br my brush isn't clean. Something very important to remember, always clean your brush. Fiona, can you tell us what is the, the, the interesting thing in any animal or plant you, you like to highlight, for example, in, when you go to the field? Yeah, um, basically anything that catches my eye, anything that I think, well, that's weird or, well, that's pretty. Um, basically anything that catches my eye, I'll draw it um, and write a few questions about it and stuff like that. Um, so I'm not really biased toward anything in particular other than birds. I, I am kind of biased towards birds. I draw a lot of birds, but I also draw plants um, and mammals and bugs and 
all sorts of that. So So if I were drawing this bird in the field, um, I would I would probably have a few different sketches of it in different positions as it was moving. Um, but I would also probably have some little notes um, about it if I had some questions, um, if I I would probably have a title. Um, so I'm going to write Arctic turn here um, and I would. So what I do on all of my nature journal pages is I make a little box in the corner like this um, and I split it into three categories. The first one is the date. Um, so today would be 5, 7, 21. The second one would be the weather. Um, at my house right now, um, it's pretty sunny um, with a few clouds. Um, so I'm gonna put in sun and some clouds and it is warm and there's no wind. Um, so then, and this is for the place. Um, so right now I'm at my house. Um, so the, so these, I call these weather boxes. Um, so basically I put them on all of my pages um, and it's just like a little mark um, to show the date, the weather and, the, and where I am. So I put those on all of my pages. Um, so some questions um, I have about this bird. Why are the primaries so long? These, the, these, these feathers on their wings that come out so far, the, those are called primary feathers. Um, and so those are the, on, on, on the edge of their wings when they're flying, on, on, on the farthest edge of their wings is the, are their primaries. Why are the primaries so long? Also wondering about the feet. Why are the feet so red? And I'm that, is it something they eat? Wondering. Um, also, I mentioned this earlier. Why do they hold their wings down? I don't know why they do that when they're when they're sitting down. Why do they hold their wings so low like that? I don't know. Um, I'm just gonna comment on how red the beak is because it is very red. So that's kind of how my page would look. Um, so with some notes, um, with one of these weather boxes, with a title, I'll put it in a little box. Um, and so that's kind of how one of my pages would look. Um, so I'm going to switch back to my face. Um, if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Fiona. I was, uh, Google, why the turn have the, the winds down and it's look like, uh, the topo, the topology of the wings. It, it depends on the behavior. Some some birds have circles, circles wind, but in, in this case of the turn, the the primary feathers, they are so long because this is our this is a soaring bird. Mm -hmm. So that's why when they close the wind, oh. it's so heavy for him. <laughs> cool, cool. Cool. And um, yeah, I, I am very inspiring for you, for your talent, Fiona. I have a nephew, she's, she's name is Aranza, and she's starting with beer washing. She's five years old also. And I, after see you work and all your passion, I definitely continue educating her to, she become a new building in the future. So thank you so much to, to share your talent with us. Thank you, thank you so, so much. Do you want to share something special with us? That's when to share you social accounts. Yeah, just keep drawing. Um, and the more you draw, um, the better you will get. Um, just keep drawing, keep putting in the pencil miles, um, keep having fun, um, and keep watching birds. That's
Yeah. And when, when, where people can find your job, your Instagram, your social media account, you can share it to let yeah, everybody I, know. I don't have any social media, um, but I do have a website, um, fionasongbird.com um, is my website. Um, so if you want to see more of my artwork um, and the other things that I do, um, that's my website. Thank you. Susan, Thank you, you so much, Fiona. Some? Yeah, I'm going to throw in my thanks to Miguel. Thanks so much. That was wonderful. And we appreciate your joining us again. You were on with us last year and you've helped us with bird camp. And so it's just been, we really appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. All right, Miguel, we're at the end of the day. I think Daniela is on. If she wants to join. Daniela. And Griselda is also here if she wants to join us. Is she too. online? Is she online? Griselda, are you online also? Oh, there she is. Yeah. All right, great. I want to give just a few last thank yous for today. I want to thank uh, BCC Live. That's Boulder County Communications Live. They do an amazing job helping us with the technology beyond behind this program. Otherwise, I know I'd be a nervous wreck. Uh, so having them manage all of the details is extremely helpful and makes you get a cleaner transmission and a better program. So thank you so much to BCC Live. And I also want to thank our translators, Claudia and Edmundo. They, you might not know it, but they've been working hard. If you haven't listened to any translations, uh, they've been working hard all day long, translating Spanish to English, English to Spanish, going back and forth rapidly. <laughs> and I, I haven't heard from them recently, so I hope they're doing okay out there. It seems like they're just moving along, but I want to thank them. Uh, for all their hard work and for making this possible. It's important to us that we be able to communicate well with all of our partners across the Western Hemisphere. So thank you so much, Claudia and Edmundo. Anything else you wanna add, Miguel? Um, yeah, tomorrow, Daniela, uh, we, uh, we're gonna have this building session during the morning so you can uh, uh, welcome to join us uh, at the 10 a.m. It's the beginning of the day. Um, yeah, we, we, we share an overview about the session for tomorrow. Don't miss the day, this official day. We, are, have, we have so many surprises for you tomorrow. Um, I want to share with people who are listening right now that we are open to work with everybody in Latin American communities. Daniela and I work very close with people from schools to institutions, universities. Um, we share educational materials uh, with the team of the World Migratory Beer Day every year. Um, the support of the donor helped people in Latin America, Mexico, and the Caribbean get this material for free. And this is very important because they don't have, uh, in, in some case, communities don't have access to internet. So physical materials uh, is the only way they can reach uh, and educate people on the ground. So please contact anybody, anyone or in our staff in the office or in the regional coordinators. Daniela have an amazing um, group of people in Mexico and they so passionate too. Daniela, uh, you want to share something to, to conclude today? Oh, well, thank you for the extraordinary day. I, I also learned a lot today. Thank you very much. I love also that part of where they show that Turkey Walter. I love it. And well, mm -hmm. the artist, there's many talent out there. And yes, if you need help uh, with something in Mexico, please let me know. Also, we have our Caribbean coordinator, Laura Bal Balboa, I think. It's a, Abula. The, Balboa, yeah. And uh, a coordinator of Central America that is Leticia Andino. And well, Miguel is our coordinator. So if you need something, please let us know, Susan or anyone of Environment for the Americas. Thank you very much. It was a great day. And Daniela, great day. I, know, I know tomorrow you have a session of songs, right? You can tell us a, a little bit about, about for tomorrow with Isaink. Ah, yeah. That will, well, I will not give the session, but Design Contreras will give this session. It's about night calls and sounds and how to record and 
how special is this and how much information it can bring us. So don't lose this opportunity to learn about this. And well, also the bird watching and many other activities that are tomorrow that will be great. Thank you. Thanks everyone. So I guess we call it a day here and wish everyone a good evening. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning or at some point during the day and uh, happy World Migratory Bird Day. Yeah, celebrate every day. Every day. <laughs> every day is bird day. <laughs> yes. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.